to count down and then sir we can start sir we'll just need 10 second to connect okay 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 so it's 3 2 1 we are live with the audience we can start this meeting over to you sir so good evening doctors myself sanjay kesri from lupin and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our international speaker speaker program mentor connect this program basically has been designed to unleash the power of sitt and dual bronchodilators in copd this program promises to be an exciting opportunity to learn from one of the most prominent experts in the field of copd globally that is dr omar usmani we are honored to have two distinguished speaker of our country who have who are basically institution in respiratory and they are none other than dr randeep guleria and dr deepak talwa we are also honored to have dr rajesh venkat sir who will be moderating the session at national level so before we go into the scientific session i will uh, request our vertical head our senior vice president mr hirak bose to take us through for the corporate presentations so hirak sir over to you thanks a lot sanjay a uh, warm good evening to all the doctors it's really a pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to uh, this academic symposia unleashing the power of sitt and dual bronchodilators in copd we are thankful to all of you for taking out time to be with us today and we are really grateful to our international speaker dr professor omar usmani and we are also really honored to have dr randeep guleria with us as the speaker today and dr deepak talwar we are also thankful to dr rajesh venkat to be with us as a national moderator and thankful to all the regional uh, moderators who are present at 17 centers across india before we go ahead uh, just a glimpse about lupin and what lupin is today so if we have to talk about lupin we have to talk about our founder dr deshbandhu gupta and according to dr deshbandhu gupta uh, we are the privileged few that have the fundamentals in place to shape a better future for the society to make world healthier and a happier and to build a better tomorrow for all the population across india and the world we embrace this not as a responsibility but as an obligation yeah so if we have to talk about uh, what lupin is globally uh, uh, today our presence is across the globe in more than 100 countries uh, we are ranked as number 12 in the world in terms of generic companies our total uh, turnover for the financial year uh 2223 uh, uh, has been 2 billion dollars and our profits have been 233 millions uh we are really having a wonderful family of 21000 plus lupinites spread across the world now coming to the local leadership uh if you have to talk about usa we are the third largest in us by prescriptions in the indian market where we originated and uh, which is the biggest market for us uh, we are ranked number 6 in the indian uh, market as per iqvia we are also the fourth largest uh, in australia and eighth largest in south africa but in terms of sales now if i have to talk about the geographical uh, 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 difference of the percentage which adds to our overall sales so india contributes around 37% of the global sales followed by us with 20 uh, 32% and we also see a very good growth coming out from the emerging markets and developed markets we are also working very hard in uh, developing adjacencies across now coming to the uh, manufacturing sites we have 15 manufacturing sites and this is spread across the globe we have our major sites in india followed by holland we are now one in usa 
one in Mexico and one in Brazil. Our research facilities are also uh, diverse. Our major facility is in, uh, Lupe, uh, in Pune and we have facilities in US and other parts of the globe now. And uh, one of the most important thing is again, uh, that uh, currently we are focusing mm -hmm. on innovative products and R&D will play a pivotal role as we go forward. Now coming to the United States, uh, our major, major focus has been in ev evolving portfolios and creating uh, a uh, complex generic pipeline. We have been in US for quite a long time now. Uh, however, we see that in the generic part, there will be always a uh, pricing pressure. So we have thought that uh, we will create a pipeline and we've already started working on that. And hopefully in a couple of months, we should start seeing the results uh, that complex uh, generics will uh, create a very big good mileage for Lupin in future. Other than that, we are also working on biosimilars and complex injectables for the US market. Now coming to the global developed market, uh, our major uh, again uh, thoughts are on uh, generating how we can come across uh, R&D platforms which can give us um, uh, innovative products and which will be able to be marketed across the globe. In India, again, uh, uh, in the uh, last few months, we have been able to come out with a lot of new innovative products. However, we our strength has been uh, tuberculosis, which we are now not only the uh, number one in India, but we are also number one across the globe. And we are also working on the latent TB part as, and we'll try uh, to support the Indian government as much as possible in eradication of TB or fight TB. <laughs> Other emerging markets, again, will be a big opportunity for us in growth. And API has been always a strength for us, especially the cephalosporins and the anti-TB product. Going forward, uh, if I have to talk about uh, our uh, uh, Indian formulation, Indian formulations, uh, our focus are more on, uh, can you shift the slide, please? Um, uh, are more focused on uh, specialty products in India. Then we have biotech, which we are developing very fast. We have complex generics, which we are uh, now working on. Generic has always been a part where we have been strong in other markets and also working on novel drug discovery development. Our uh, major uh, key therapy areas has always been anti-tuberculosis, which has given us the mileage to go across the world. However, now if I have to talk about cardio, diabetes, and respiratory are the major focus area for uh, Lupin in India as well as across the globe. And also we are working very hard on the CNS disorders, how to manage that. Coming to the Indian populations, again, the three uh, product, uh, therapy areas where we are majorly focused are cardiac, where we are ranked number three, anti-diabetic, where we are ranked number three, and in respiratory, where we are ranked number two. Going ahead, uh, for having a good sales, I think distribution channel plays a pivotal role because our product should be available across the geographies in the last mile even. And for that, we have seven central warehouses, 27 distribution centers, we are available with 4,000 wholesalers. And if coming to the pharmacies, more than 7 lakh pharmacies, our products are available across. And we also have the cold chain facilities, which helps us to take it forward. Coming to the Lupin Respiratory Franchising, uh, we started with one, and I am very nostalgic about that. And many of you have seen that we started with 50 people at the beginning, but the journey had been wonderful. And today, I'm really proud to tell that we have five teams across and more than 1,800 people in these teams working and focusing on respiratory alone. The journey uh, in terms of IQVIA, uh, reported markets, we have in the last five years grown from 637 crores to 1,009 crores. And our objectives are very clear that we want to double it up in the next four years going ahead. Now, uh, 
uh, the respiratory vertical was always known for coming out with uh, innovative launches. And we are the first one to have the pin piercing technology in India. Today, the DPI is taken all through pin piercing technology. Before uh, Lupi Haler, it was all about uh, breaking technology, but we are able to ship that. And today, uh, across India and across the globe, pin uh, piercing technology is accepted as the best technology. We also launched in 2011 the intercatrol plane in India and in 15 the combination of intercatrol glycoperineum. Uh, uh, in 2018, again, we came out with something new, which is again uh, only with us that is the OPEP device, Aerobica. No other company in India has that. And especially for non pharmacological treatment, it is one of the best choice for mucus clearance. Other than that, we also have a breath actuated nebulizer, which nobody has it in India. And recently, we also were able to launch Diffisma into the Indian market, the first combination of Indacatrol, Glycoperineum, and Mometazole. Not only about the products, but when you see across the academics, we always have our pursuit towards ac academic excellence. And I should thank all the doctor fraternity for constantly helping us. Uh, the first one was, of course, our association with Indian Chess Society way back in 2007, when we started a lot of activities together. And in 2010, uh, we were able to tie up with Chess, the uh, American College of Chess Physician, and started our academic program called RELM, Revolution in Advanced Lung Management. In 2015-16, we were able to tie up with Olympus and a group of doctors in India who are best in intervention and uh, started our program called FLIP, Focused Learning and Interventional Pulmonology. We also extended that to the pediatric part because we saw that very few pediatrics were doing intervention. So today, uh, in last two years, we have been able to train around 100 pediatricians on bronchoscopy. And Skiplex is a wonderful platform, a learning platform for the PGs. It's a one-stop where everybody can learn whatever they like. Going ahead, one of the major uh, challenges we all faced and the doctors also faced across is the inhalation technique. Uh, because most of the peoples, when we did a survey across India and the world, it was seen that four out of five patients were not taking their inhaler correctly. So we were able to launch joint airway initiative during the COVID time. And one of the challenges was also there was no chance of come meeting the patients and demonstrating it to them. So Jai was born out of that. And it is India's first digital asthma educator with value added service for the patients to breathe better. Skiflix, again, today we are very fortunate that 1,800 PGs across India in the first year, second year, and third year are uh, registered with Skiflix and the are spending, when I take an average timeout, uh, average timeout of around uh, 32 minutes per month into the Skiflix platform. Uh, going uh, ahead, uh, we are uh, pegged at 1009 Pro. We are the second largest respiratory major with a market share of 13%. We are also second largest in the pediatric respiratory market. Our uh, market share in the inhalation is 20.1%, and we reach over 60,000 plus HCPs. In the Indac Glyco segment where we launched, we have been able to capture 88% market share. And we are the only company having a bot, a chatbot for uh, awareness in the field of respiratory, for tuberculosis as well as for respiratory. So my thought is uh, always has been think respiratory, think lupin. And uh, that's what our team believes in. And uh, it had been wonderful interacting with you. Now to take the uh, proceedings forward, I will request Dr. Raunak to take it over. And thanks everybody and thanks a lot to all the doctors. Thank you. Over to you, Raunak. Yeah. Thank you, Yudhishthir, for enlightening all of us with UPS importance uh, totally in India and globally. UPS contribution to patients and, and to all the therapeutic areas and multiple initiatives to help the patients to help SCPs and to upscale the uh, patient care uh, across the continents. So can I have my slide, please? Yeah. Oh. 
so uh, thank you once again welcome to all to this mentor connect program the master of stake so objectives for today's program are to understand latest evidence and updated guideline recommendations in pharmacotherapy of copd to discuss clinical implications of updated recommendations while selecting triple or dual pharmacotherapy from perspective of global as well indian copd patients and to understand role of sitt of fluticasone propionate formoterol fumarate plus gycopyranium and dual bronchodilator therapy of gycopyranium and formoterol so uh, once again welcoming all the luminaries dr usmani dr venkat dr guleria dr talwar it's a pleasure for us to have you all of you here we welcome all the 17 regional hub moderators speakers and participants we have multiple pulmonologists chief physicians fellows and sfps attending online this is also live on youtube and we are sure you will uh, get a great scientific bonanza from the leaders of the field in respiratory medicine so this is a agenda in brief uh, that dr venkat sir our moderator will will uh, handle everything in brief so to speak about dr rajesh venkat sir he is a senior consultant and hod of pulmonary medicine rajagiri hospital kochi sir has delivered more than 100 guest lectures at international national and zonal meetings and he has about more than 80 publications in reputed journals he has organized very successfully napcon 2019 in kochi sir's core area of interest are intensive respiratory care management of asthma copd and vaccination sir has been uh, awarded multiple times and to say few indian society of critical care medicine dr santosham memorial gold medal and the young pulmonologist award so it's my pleasure to welcome dr rajesh v sir please over to you sir thank you thank you dr ronak for those very kind words and can i have my slides please projected so uh, very warm evening to all the esteemed faculty delegates as well as uh, organizers you have the pointer so again i welcome the esteemed international speaker professor usmani we are really fortunate to have you with us sir and along with that we have the national luminaries randeep sir and deepak sir who have been the teacher of teachers the mentor to many of the mentors and of course all the regional center moderators faculty and finally the delegates because the success of any of the program is with the attendance of delegates who are motivated and attentive and again a very 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 big thanks to lupin respira specialty care team kirak sir sanjay sir all all the members of the lupin family for coming up with this very innovative cme because right from the time gold 2023 has been released copd was has been one of the very core area of focus we almost see a couple of academic discussions at the national level in copd after the release of gold 2023 so to throw some light on some of the key aspects this particular national cme is being organized so in the next 5 minutes i will just try to share with you some of the peculiarities of indian copd patients the burden of copd in india of course i think randeep sir will be elaborating that in a great detail the awareness and attitudes of indian patients to copd therapy as well as copd as a disease the th what therapy actually the indian patients do receive the availability and choice of copd medications in indian pharmacy market so if you see the peculiarities of copd in india we have a huge burden of non smoking copds including the biomass uh, fuel exposure copds the tuberculosis associated uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease etc which actually form a substantial bulk we have a substantial diagnostic and treatment gaps some of them are actually attitudinal from the part of the patients as i will come to in my subsequent slides and our clinicians have a lot of choice in fact i can even go to the extent of saying that our clinicians are spoiled for choices when it comes to molecules for inhalational therapy the combinations the doses the delivery devices etc etc et which makes the upfront choice of therapy slightly confusing and difficult for an individual practicing clinician the copd burden in india is pretty huge this has been acknowledged across multiple review articles and publications in uh, various indian journals but it serves to say that almost 7.4% of indian adults have are estimated to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease 
and of the total global dialysis due to chronic respiratory diseases, almost 32% is contributed by India. So that's a huge number considering the huge population of India. India is the most populous country in the world. COPD is the second leading cause of death in India. India almost contributes to one third of the total global health loss from chronic respiratory diseases and high risk of COPD exacerbations because of delayed diagnosis, very peculiar risk factors for our country like biomass fuel exposure, air pollution, tobacco use, and of course, post-tuberculous uh, obstetric pulmonary disease. The awareness and attitude of Indian COPD patients, if we look at that, it's seen that only 3% of COPD patients are actually aware that they have COPD. And again, even those of those patients who have COPD, 54% of the patients don't actually know what COPD as a disease is. And even though some of them know that they probably have COPD, they find it very difficult to accept. So 43% of the patients actually don't accept the diagnosis in uh, themselves. And only a minority of them take regular treatment. And when it comes to treatment, only 58% of the COPD patients in India receive inhalational therapy. And of those 58%, almost 31% are on levosalbutamol alone and 18% on levosalbutamol plus beclomethasone. So, uh, uh, Laba-Lama combination or a triple therapy combination is a rarity when it comes to the average COPD patient for India. And 42% receive only oral therapy, 16% receive theophylines, and 19% of them actually receive multiple spurts of oral corticosteroid during exacerbations. Now, with this background, what are the drugs that are available for COPD therapy in India? The Indian pulmonologist has a plethora of treatment options, but this is an advantage as well as a liability because he has a lot of things to choose with, but he is a bit confused as to what to choose with. So, these are a lot of combinations. We have dual therapy, we have triple therapy, we have triple therapy as a single inhaler form, we have triple therapy as multiple inhalers right from intercatural glycoperonium to formatural butyrosulfate glycoperonium, intercatural mamatural glycoperonium, formatural fluticosome glycoperonium, etc., etc. So we have a lot of choices and there are multiple industries marketing the, marketing the same molecule. For example, if we see the just combination of formatural with glycoperonium, we have at least seven, eight companies marketing it in different formulations, different delivery devices and different, different doses. So despite this fact, we have a paucity of head to head trials. So that makes us confusing whether which is the best option. So when there is a lack of head-to-head -head trials, we always rely on pharmacological and rationality for selection of options as well as personal experience. So which molecule, which combination, which device to use in which profile of patients. So the gaps in COPD care when it comes to India are that the patient attitudes as to poor awareness, high symptom burden, poor symptom perception and lack of acceptance. Diagnostic gaps in the form of underutilization of spirometry, treatment gaps in the form of poor prescription and adherence to inhaled therapy, prescription of short acting agents, and high risk of exacerbations. The clinicians challenge as to choice of ideal drug and ideal choice for an upfront therapy and the best suited delivery device. So, with this particular Indian scenario and the gaps in COPD care in India, we request Professor Omar Usmani to throw his experience, his evidence, his uh, words of wisdom on how to tackle uh, these gaps in Indian patients and to introduce him. I don't know how to shorten his CV and introduce in a couple of minutes. I think it's next to impossible. But to be very brief, he is Professor of Respiratory Medicine at the National Heart and Lung Institute, Imperial College, London, and a consultant physician at the Lo Royal Brompton Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital, London. His clinical specialization is in asthma, COPD, chronic cough, etc. And he is a group leader and principal investigator at Airway Disease Section at the National Heart and Lung Institute. He, his, he has received a lot of key research grants, including the uh, UK National Institute for Health Research Career Development Fellowship in 2015, the U Horizon 2020 grant, Jan 70, the UK Newton Fund, etc., etc., to name a few. Lots of awards and recognitions coming his way, including the International Authority on Aerosol Science and Inhalation Medicine. He has delivered a keynote lectures at various prestigious international scientific meetings. Lot of awards also coming his way, the Thomas T. Mercer Award from the American Association of Aerosol Research, etc., etc. So, in fact, if we search 10 papers in obstetric airway diseases, landmark papers, at least two or three would be bearing his name across the globe. So we are very fortunate to have you here, sir, and looking forward to hear from you regarding your words of wisdom to tackle this, some of the gaps of COPD care in India. Over to you, sir. 
Dr. Venkat, thank you very much for the introduction. I was fascinated to hear about um, the, <laughs> the issues that you presented in India. And actually, those issues are actually present, believe it or not, all the way throughout the world. And I'm sure we'll be able to pick up very much um, when we um, have the discussion later on. So I've just come back from the American Thoracic Society, and that was in Washington, as you know, last month. And there's been a huge amount of talk on COPD and also the COPD directive. And I'm really going to start by delving in into the roadmap over the next 30 minutes. So we're going to talk about Gold 2023, the directive where ABCD, you now know, has changed to ABE. Um, the dual bronchodilation, also therapy of clinical evidence, triple therapy, the clinical evidence, patient profiling, and we've heard a little bit about that, and then stepping up and stepping down. And it's also a delight for the invitation from Lupin to be on this Connect program, where we are going to talk about the science and how the science translates to the clinic, and really the clinic in terms of what we do for our patients. So you appreciate the global COPD burden. You've just heard the presentation from Dr. Venkat. I think these um, figures are very familiar to you. You remember the threes, 300 million, more than 3 million die each year, third leading cause of death. It's an easy way to remember. And now the goal 2023 directives. So where are we? Well, we are with the same goals of reducing symptoms. That's what we try and do when we see our patients in the clinic who are complaining about their symptomatology. And also we're trying to reduce risk and particularly prevent disease progression, prevent exacerbations and treat them and reduce mortality. And I know mortality is a hot topic and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's just go through this in a little bit more detail. ABCD is now ABE. So we start off with a spirometrically confirmed diagnosis. We assess airflow obstruction. You see that on the top panel. And the final box in the arrow is we're assessing symptoms risks. So we know that our grades are gold one, gold two, gold three, gold four. We're familiar with them. They're based on the FEV1. But when we're managing our patients, now look at the far right on the bottom, you now see A, B, and E. And very clearly, we now know that um, A and B are divided based on symptoms. So a CAT score less than 10 or a CAT score more than 10. And we know exacerbations on the y-axis, zero or one moderate exacerbations places you with A and B, greater than two moderate exacerbations or more than one leading to hospitalization leads you to E. So this is how the GOLD directive has evolved. And here we can clearly see now there's a lot of um, uh, interest in the category of E, which is more than two moderate exacerbations. And you can see that C and D are not there anymore. Indeed, with A, B, C, D, we used to debate quite a bit that actually we didn't find many of those C patients who had a CAT score less than 10, but were actually um, quite predominant with their exacerbation history. So having set the scene on where we are now with A and B and E, let's now look at the assessment tool of initiation of pharmacotherapy. So once again on the x-axis, we have symptomatology, the CAT score less than 10 or the MMRC 0 to 1, or on the right-hand side, the CAT score greater than 10 or the MMRC greater than 2, and on the y-axis again, exacerbations as we've just spoken about. So we select initial pharmacotherapy based upon current symptoms and also the exacerbation history. So how does that pan out? Well, in A, we have bronchodilator, either long or short acting, Lava, Lama, Saba or Sama. And long acting are generally preferred. I think we appreciate this now over the last decade, certainly amongst our patients. Um, on the right hand side in B, we have Lava, Lama. So this is now the resident treatment for group B, and we should consider single inhaler option for convenience with our patient. Indeed, we've seen over the last 15, 20 years where we initially had um, single inhaler therapy, and over time we've moved to dual in single and then triple in single. And then E on the top you see is Lava Lama. But if the eosinophil count, the blood eosinophil count is more than 300, you should consider a LABA plus LAMA plus an ICS and consider single inhaler options for patient convenience. So that's the initiation tool of pharmacotherapy as per the GOLD directive based on now the ABE classification. And again, to highlight, and we will be talking about this, triple therapy, lots of discussion about this, I'm sure there is in the audience, with the eosinophils greater than 300.
Now, follow-up pharmacotherapy is important. If your response to initial treatment is appropriate, then you essentially um, are absolutely okay to maintain it. And that's what one would do as our patients feel that they are stable. But if not, then for sure, check adherence and inhaler technique and consider the predominant treatable trait to target either dyspnea or exacerbation. So this is still there in the goal directive with dyspnea, LABA or LAMA, and then step up to a dual bronchodilator LABA-LAMA and consider switching inhaler devices or molecules. So we've seen in Dr. Venkat's presentation, there are multiple combinations, multiple devices, multiple posology, multiple doses, and here really it comes down to there's very few head to head and it is very much the confidence that you have in that therapy, the science behind it, the pharmacology, the device, and also the interaction between the device and the patient and ultimately the patient actually remaining stable. So dyspnea is controlled. Remember to implement or escalate non-pharmacological treatments, so smoking cessation, and um, if there is access, obviously pulmonary rehabilitation, and investigate other causes of dyspnea. And we recognize that COPD patients, 20% of them have depression, some have anxiety, and then heart failure. We also know that they may have decreased excursion of the thoracic cage because of osteoporosis. So all the comorbidities we need to recognize because we appreciate that COPD is a systemic disorder of systemic inflammation, not just that of the respiratory tract. So now looking at exacerbations, and if we look, if you have a LABA or a LAMA, and if your blood is in full count is less than 300, then you have a dual bronchodilator on board. Now, if your blood is in full count is greater than 300, or indeed, consider if your ears and are more than 100 on a LABA LAMA, then you go to a triple therapy of LABA LAMA plus ICS. And again, that was there in the old iteration and it's here in the new iteration, but now you see that it's going from the LABA LAMA dual bronchodilator straight to the triple. And consider if your eosinophil count is less than 100, um, the other options of Roflumilast, and um, there your FEV1 is less than 50% with chronic bronchitis production, um, mucus production, and certainly azithromycin, not just as an antibacterial, but also um, as an immunomodulatory function, particularly those in former smokers. I think the key point that we forget is, is also that you can have a step-down approach in your patients with COPD. Now, we appreciate that's very embedded within the asthma and the GINA directive. Um, and in COPD, I think it's quite important. So you step up and you give that patient the opportunity, and then there are options for you to consider stepping down that patient based on their resolution, their symptom control, their eosinophils, or their non-response potentially to treatment. So I think we need to think about that. And we will come back to the LABA LAMA and the ICS. So in the next five minutes, let's review some of the dual bronchodilator therapy um, aspects. We know the initial treatment is there. I've spoken about this. It's gold group B, highly symptomatic, but low exacerbation risk. They often have a significant disease burden. It's a significant impact on their health and well-being. And it is associated with a high future risk of hospitalized exacerbations and mortality compared with gold group A patients. So here, consider the initiation with dual bronchodilator therapy or early escalation. Um, I mean, actually, we, we say early escalation to dual therapy, but I think the move now is very much and was being discussed is considered dual bronchodilation almost from the outset to give that patient the optimal treatment um, um, with respect to their lungs. So let's now review then in that context that I've just said, the pinnacle study. So these are dual bronchodilation with LABA LAMA versus monotherapy or placebo. And I think the set of slides that I'm going to show are quite easy to follow. So if you look on the top panel with the different colors, it's an RCT over 3,700 patients, 24 weeks, LABA plus LAMA versus LABA or LAMA. And these were moderate to severe COPD patients. And we've always been told now that with our COPD clinical trials, look at the study design, look at the demographics of the patients that were entered. And here, if you look at the text on the left-hand side, it was glycoprotein plus fomoterol, and this improved morning predose trough FEV1, and the change from baseline in morning predose trough at week 24, and you can see the markers there, and they were all statistically significant. And that is now displayed in the graphical format here, pinnacle one, pinnacle two, because they were both 
duplicates. You see on the x-axis the number of weeks, and you can see on the y-axis your um, trough um, FEV1 predose, and you can see the combination there in the closed circle red dots of glycoperonium formotrol, significantly greater than the individual therapies and indeed against placebo. So here we can see in the in the studies that glycoperonium formotrol reduced the relative um, rate reduction um, glyco, um, glycoperonium formotrol versus glycoperonium itself by 18% versus formotrol in the second bar 15% and versus placebo as you would expect 28%. In terms of time to first moderate or severe COPD exacerbations actually flavored the glycoperonium plus formotrol dual bronchodilator combination. And this was consistently superior versus isolated LAMA monotherapy or monotherapy LABA alone across the Pinnacle studies. And I think you can clearly see that um, in the data that's presented in Pinnacle 1, 2, 4, and the pool Pinnacle data. You see that on the y-axis. And then each of those segments, panel 1, panel 2, panel 3, um, with the change from baseline in morning predose trough, favoring the dual bronchodilator of glycoperonium and formotrol. So let's now move on. Visha Vetsisha from Imperial did a network meta-analysis. Some of you may remember this, but to refresh you, let's go across again the top line. 26 studies, over 32,000 patients, over a year, LABA LAMA dual bronchodilator versus monotherapy LAMA, and with a high exacerbation COPD risk. And you can see here that the improvement in the total score on the SGRQ, the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, was greater in the dual bronchodilator versus the monotherapy LAM, and that was statistically significant. And you can see that on the forest plot there quite clearly, favoring the dual bronchodilator therapy with the forest plot shifted to the left. Now, in the same network meta-analysis, the improvement in FEV1 at 12 months was greater in the LABA LAMA group. And here you can see the forest plot, and to the right is favoring the dual bronchodilator versus the monotherapy of LAMA in the pool studies of uh, 26 studies. And then let's revisit the FLAME study. We're all familiar with this, but I think it's really good to put it in context. This is dual bronchodilator, we remember, versus LABA ICS. So the randomized controlled trial, 1,600 over patients over one year, dual bronchodilator versus LABA ICS. And again, the demographics of the patients were that they were high exacerbation COPD risk. And it was clear to see that dual bronchodilator was the preferred choice for initial therapy. And now we re um, look at this in gold group E patients, as you can see here, um, looking at that data. And this is um, from um, gold 2023. And the LABA LAMA was more effective than the LABA ICS in preventing COPD exacerbations. And this is why people have questioned how, why the gold um, team and the gold panel have moved towards the LABA LAMA and then step up to triple, then we will come to that. And here you see the 70% um, risk reduction that we're familiar with. In the FLAME study, again, I think this is familiar to you, and you can see very clearly weeks on the x-axis, y probability of exacerbation, and you can see any the dual bronchodilator versus LABA ICS less than 16%, moderate to severe um, uh, decreased by 22%, and severe decreased by um, 19%. So the dual bronchodilator had a longer time to the first moderate or severe exacerbation than did the LABA ICS group. Now, in this network meta-analysis that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, again by Visha Vetsisha, the 26 studies, as we've seen before, we can see that the improvement over time in the total score was greater in the LABA LAMA group than in the LABA ICS group. And here, this is the comparison analysis 1.8 of LABA LAMA versus LABA ICS change from baseline. So it's the delta in the SGRQ at 12 months. And you can see the forest plot there favoring the dual bronchodilator versus now favoring the LABA ICS. So comparison to LABA ICS here in the network meta-analysis that was undertaken. And similarly, again, comparing dual bronchodilator to LABA ICS, we see that the change from baseline in FEV1 in one year favors the LABA LAMA dual bronchodilator forest plot on the right-hand side versus the LABA ICS you can see there on the left-hand side. So it's really nice that the network meta-analysis undertaken in the pool range of studies is actually showing signals from the individual studies at a collective level. So the advantages of the dual bronchodilator compared to LAMA monotherapy or LABA monotherapy or indeed ICS-LABA um, uh, therapy is improvement in lung function, 
significant reduction in exacerbations and significant improvement in symptoms quality of life ever seen in the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. But we do recognize the limitations of dual therapy and therefore we've got A, B and E and we recognize the step up approach. Now there's a lot of discussion in mortality. So there's no significant difference in mortality versus LABA, LAMA, LABA, ICS or LAMA. We recognize for the LABA, ICS, the TORCH study from many years ago, um, and we recognize some signals coming out from uplift and monotherapy. Patients with high risk of exacerbations are underrepresented in the dual bronchodilator studies. So again, look at the study design. In high risk patients, there's a high exacerbation risk which persists despite them taking the LABA, LAMA. And there is an inflammatory component which remains undressed um, with the Lama Lava. And again, we recognize that COPD is a systemic inflammatory disorder. So let's move on then to triple therapy in the next five minutes and we'll finish um, um, well within time to, um, to have a good Q&A after the next two speak, um, discussions by Dr. Galeria and Dr. Talwal. So triple therapy. Let's revisit the association of eosinophilia and clinical outcomes. So we start with the first panel, sputum and blood eosinophilia actually goes frequently in patients with exacerbations. And Dave Singh, who I know you know, has presented data on this going back to 15 years, and so has Mona Baffadel. So that's linked to blood eosinophils, which are a good surrogate now of sputum eosinophils or indeed lung eosinophilia. So there's a maximum response to corticosteroid treatment, which allows you to have a reduction in sputum eosinophilia, and this is proportional to reduction in exacerbation rates, which translates to improved clinical outcomes. And Burge and colleagues reported on this way back at the turn of the millennia in 2000 in British Medical Journal, and you see that reference there um, on the bottom, and we've been discussing this now for, the, for, the, for a good two decades beyond. So if we now highlight the gold directive, the recommendation on ICS use, so two ticks, it strongly favors ICS add-on with a history of hospitalization for exacerbations, more than two moderate exacerbations of COPD, greater than 300 cells for Mike Leiter is the fills. And if there is comorbidity of asthma, and we recognize that many of our patients have long-standing asthma, they develop fixed airflow obstruction, there is, an, there is a high inflammatory component and they may also benefit. One tick favor ICS add on to one moderate exacerbation between 100 to 299 cells and um, with eosinophils. But one would disfavor where you have frequent episodes of pneumonia, less than 100 cells in terms of your eosinophil count, and certainly relevant to the region and many other areas, a history of mycobacterial infection. So if we now move on and just try and understand the scientific basis, basis behind the goal directive, the benefit of ICS add-on, and this was a meta-regression analysis, and this was undertaken by Mario Cazola um, in um, Naples, just published about four or five years ago, and he's followed up with further meta-analyses and meta-regression analysis. And you can clearly see here the eosinophil count there is on the x-axis, ranging from 100 up to 450. On the y-axis, you have the relative risk with the acute exacerbation of COPD, and there's a greater risk reduction in acute exacerbations of COPD with higher eosinophilic counts. And the circles that you see there are the plots from within the meta-regression analysis that he undertook. And this is eosinophils being a significant effect modifier of triple therapy in preventing the risk of acute exacerbations. So let's now look at that meta-analysis in a little bit more detail where he looked, Mario Cazola, in 14 randomized control trials in over 16,000 patients between 2 to 52 weeks, LABA, LABA, ICS versus LAMA LABA. So triple ICS versus dual bronchodilator therapy in those with a high exacerbation risk. And there was a protective effect of triple for risk reduction of moderate or severe acute exacerbations of COPD. And this was great in patients with higher eosinophil accounts. So you see here in the graph there, in the top, 400 eosinophils, then 300 eosinophils, then 150. In the second panel, you have the various studies, wisdom, sunset, tribute, and impact. You have the cumulative estimate, the confidence intervals, and then you have the plot here. And you can see overwhelmingly favoring the triple going to the left with relative risk reduction in acute exacerbations of COPD compared to those studies that actually had a dual bronchodilator component to Lava Lama. And 
If we now go to um, Corey's um, 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 meta-analysis, and this was published just a couple of years in, the, in 2021, they looked at triple therapy versus dual bronchodilator on risk reduction of exacerbation. So four RCTs, 13,000 patients, between half a year to a year, ICS added on to Lava Lama, and these were moderate to severe COPD. And again, the forest plot clearly shows you um, um, favoring the triple versus favoring um, Lava Lama. And the relative risk reduction they found was 27% in the incidence of exacerbation with triple. So we're seeing a consistency now, aren't we, in terms of 20 to 25% with that add-on in terms of that risk reduction in exacerbations. And here, with um, uh, the study that they then undertook on triple therapy versus dual bronchodilator therapy, five RCTs, 12,000 patients, up to a year, ICS added on, moderate to severe COPD, and here again, it's favoring the triple with the forest plot there going to the left rather than the lava lava, and with a relative risk reduction here in the instance now of mortality of 34%. So this introduces the concept of triple therapy in mortality, and we've seen quite a few network analyses. Some of them were presented at the ATS at Washington um, with respect to as a potential class effect, triple therapy decreasing um, or having an, um, uh, uh, an effect on mortality that we're seeing again around sort of 25%, um, 30%. This is really fascinating. It's just been published in Pneumonology 2023. I thought it'd be really good to show and share with you. Um, and it's the association of eosinophils and exacerbation history. It's really interesting because the different colors give you the different um, uh, treatments. Um, you can see also in capital letters, the different studies that are being linked. On the x-axis, you see the categorization of mild, moderate, and severe exacerbations. You have also see um, eosinophil counts. And on the y, axis you see benefit. And really, it summarizes really nicely, if you get the chance to have a look at this, I would, um, that eosinophil counts and past exacerbation profile may equally play relevant roles to predict the individual risk. So it's about individual risk prediction for that patient. Eosinophil count, past exacerbation in that patient that's sitting in front of you and me in the clinic, and a comprehensive approach Considering these two predictors is needed to aid clinicians to decide on preventative actions in a choice of first line or step up treatment. So the move now is, is yes, we have bloody eosinophils, but we've also got to obviously have the exacerbation as defined by the Y axis on the goal directive with respect to stepping up um, um, treatment. So again, in the final then section of this, single inhaler therapy versus um, uh, um, uh, um, 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 multiple inhaler therapies. So we've talked about dual bronchodilators, we've talked about triple therapy, and I really now just want to talk a little bit about inhalers, as you would expect me to. So here, single inhaler versus multiple inhaler triple therapy, and you can see here that in um, gold 2023, they have um, uh, this um, 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 oversight, and, and Rajiv Da um, uh, or, um, uh, um, has also um, uh, um, presented um, and published in ERJ Open Research um, single inhaler triple therapy 300 versus um, multiple 278. And you can see persistence was better with SITT. There was a reduction in exacerbations significantly with SITT, all cause mortality was better with SICT. And also you can see there the cost um, was lower with SITT. So single inhaler triple therapy, you can see is um, probably logically um, you would predict this because it's three drugs in one really. Um, so stepping up, when we want to step up our patients, and I think Really, I've reiterated this, but the key point here is we've talked about gold A, we've talked about gold B, dual bronchodilator, we've talked about gold E, dual bronchodilator, and we see gold E now with more than 300 eosinophils with that history combined of the exacerbations, then you would consider triple therapy stepping up. And for the reasons that we've discussed um, um, in the triple therapy section. And I think it's important also to step down and we need to uh, we need to develop this um, amongst our clinical practice and extend this. So you've got LABA plus LABA and ICS triple therapy, and I would consider de-escalation if the patient develops an episode of pneumonia. 
if really there's a lack of response that you see in your patient, so how long one would one go? People vary between going from three to six months um, and step down then to dual bronchitis later. And again, you'd need to um, um, monitor the, the response to your patients. And de-escalating, where has that been explored? You know the data, it's the sunset trial. And uh, from triple to dual bronchodilator therapy, again, RCT, 1,000 patients, half a year, ICS withdrawal here from triple therapy and non-frequently exacerbating moderate to severe COPD. And you can see here really um, the annual exacerbation rates. And in the sunset trial, ICS withdrawal led to a reduction um, in trough FEV1 of 26 mil. So this is the element within the sunset trial that the withdrawal led to a reduction in the FEV1 of 26 mils. Now, 20 mils in our patients, in some of them, may not be impactful, in some it will be. There was a lot of discussion about this. Um, and you can see there um, the confidence intervals were from minus 53 to 1 mil, exceeding the non-inferiority margin. Um, and in the subgroup analysis, though, based on eosinophil levels, so that drove the um, subgroup analysis in what we saw, patients with eosinophils of more than 300 presented greater fun lung function loss and higher exacerbation risk um, post-ICS um, withdrawal. So in your patients who have got more than 300 eosinophils, you may need to be wary of ICS withdrawal um, and may need to continue on for um, a longer period of time. So clinical pearls, initiate the COPD treatment early, preferably with dual bronchodilator. And we recognize on the gold directive, you've got Saba Saba and Lama Lama in gold A, but there is a trend now to give your patients optimal bronchodilation. Triple therapy is recommended in single inhaler for patients with high exacerbation risk, high xenophil count, and for patients with COPD and asthma. There's the mortality reduction signal that we're now seeing in numerous papers and publications over the last few years. Um, ICS withdrawal should be done under specific circumstances, and patients should be continued on dual bronchodilator therapy as step down. So consider step down as a um, positive option, but we wet be wary in who you try that. And single inhaler therapy um, really to improve patient compliance and to simplify treatment. So I think having gone through dual bronchodilator, triple therapy, the device, stepping up, stepping down, tailoring it to our patients, picking up on mortality, xenophils and exacerbations, I'll hand you back to the team in Delhi. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Usmani, for those uh, very crisp but very clear words. And I think that would have taken away the clouds of thought from the minds of many of us. But what we sincerely request you is to stay back for the question and answer session also after the two sessions by uh, Professor Guleria and uh, Dr. Deepak Talwar. So just to introduce Dr. Uh, Randeep Guleria, I don't think he needs any introduction to any respiratory crowd in India or beyond. He has been one of the icons of worship for most of the younger pulmonologists, including me. He has been a leader to, from whom we have learned a lot. He is currently chairman of the Institute of Internal Medicine and Respiratory and Sleep Medicine at Medanta. And he has been former director and CEO for the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the premier medical institute of the country. He has been heading that. He is a member of the Empowered Group 2 created by the Prime Minister's Office for Multisectorial Management of COVID-19. He's a life member of most of the major medical associations. And he has been honored with the prestigious Padma Shri Award in 2015, Dr. B.C. Roy National Award for Eminent Medical Person for the year 2014, the Lung India Award for the Best Original Article in Lung India by the Indian Society in 2014, and a lot, many more. And it's really iconic that Dr. Randeep Guleria and Dr. Deepak Talwara are together in this forum. And if I'm not mistaken, the first program in DM in pulmonary medicine in PGA Chandigarh started with two seats. And if I'm not mistaken, sir, Dr. Guleria and Dr. Talwar were the first two of that. Am I correct, sir? So very fortunate to have both of you together here. And over to you, Randeep, sir. Thank you, Rajesh, for your kind words. Thank you. And I'd like to start by also thanking Lupin for this Connect program. Uh, may I have my slides, please? 
So I shall basically be touching on two aspects. One is the how COPD is different as far as Indian patients are concerned and how SIT therapy, single uh, inhalation triple therapy may be useful as far as Indian patients are concerned. So let's start with what is the burden of disease as far as COPD in India is concerned. And I'll start with this paper published in the Lancet in 2017. Many of us were involved in the data collection. And the paper was very nicely entitled Nations Within a Nation because it looked at the transition across different Indian states from 1990 to 2016. And it looked at two broad groups. One was communicable diseases, maternal mortality, nutritional and neonatal diseases as compared to non-communicable diseases and injuries. And the darker the color, darker the red, more the communicable diseases, more blue the color, more the non-communicable diseases. And in 1990, one state had already started moving towards NCDs, and that was the state of Kerala. But if you look at central India, there was a huge burden as far as communicable diseases was concerned. But when you fast forward to 2016, you'll find that the map has totally changed. And now we are having a huge burden as far as non-communicable diseases are concerned. And therefore, states in the south have a larger burden. But even central India has showing this transition which has happened. And this happened somewhere between 2004 to 2006. But what is really interesting is that if you started looking at this data and we started looking at the cause of disability adjusted life years, which had changed in 2016, one factor which came out was that COPD had become one of the predominant factors in 2016 as far as the global the burden of disease in India was concerned. And air pollution also was one of the leading factors as far as risk factors was concerned. Part of the Global Burden of Disease study, which was also subsequently published, which looked at the chronic respiratory disease. And chronic respiratory disease looks predominantly at COPD and asthma. And again, this looked at from 1990 to 2016. And what one finds is that there was a huge change as far as chronic respiratory disease is concerned in males and in females. But what was worrying was that the age standardized COPD prevalence in India was 1.5 times the global average. And the A standardized disability adjusted live years was 1.7 times the global average. So we were having a much faster development in terms of prevalence and disability as far as COPD was concerned. So what this actually showed was that again, from the prevalence of COPD not being very high in 1990 to what it was in 2016, the burden of disease has increased significantly as far as COPD is concerned. So in, 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 from 1990 to 2016, there's been a nearly 30% increase in the prevalence of COPD as far as India is concerned. So the burden of disease has become huge. And therefore, as was already mentioned, it's the second leading cause of death in India. More than 20% of global COPD-related deaths occur from India. 1.7 times disability adjusted live year rates as, at COPD as compared to the global average. And a lot of factors which I'll come to contribute to this rather than just smoking itself. So the major challenges that we have, and this is also discussed, that there is a lot of barriers in the diagnosis of COPD, and therefore I still feel it's underestimated. Limited spirometry is available in primary care setup, and therefore the diagnosis is actually delayed. There is also delayed referral, delayed initial diagnosis, and therefore because of this, most of our COPD patients actually present in a more advanced stage we hardly see early stage COPD. Very often it's just passed off as smoker's cough or related to just seasonal cough. And therefore, patients who come to us with COPD have reduced lung function, frequent exacerbation, and poor quality of life. Challenges that we have and data suggest that the challenges are related to uh, forgetfulness about taking medication, belief that medications are not required on a regular basis and only when you have symptoms. And then there is also a stigma as far as using inhalers are concerned. All of this leads to challenges in as far as treatment in our own patients are concerned. So not only is the burden of COPD significant, we also have different etiotypes or phenotypes as the recent gold guideline mentioned as far as Indian population is concerned. This is basically from Dr. Jindal's uh, book, which looks at risk factors of COPD as far as India is concerned. And you look at factors like environmental tobacco smoke, biomass exposure, air pollution, tuberculosis, all are risk factors which are unique or in the developing world and something that is actually present as far as India is concerned. And this has also been documented. 
this is a paper published in the Lancet Planetary Health in 2018, which looked at the impact of air pollution on deaths, disease burden, life expectancy. And it actually calculated that almost 1.24 million people died in India in 2017 due to air pollution, both indoor and outdoor air pollution. And if you look at this paper and you look at the disability adjusted life years, again, what you would find interesting is that the disability adjusted life year for COPD is much more due to air pollution than it is due to tobacco use. And therefore, air pollution is causing much bigger problem as far as COPD is concerned than even the use of tobacco. And this has been highlighted in this paper that if you look at both men and women, then ambient air pollution and household air pollution are leading cause as far as disability adjusted life years is concerned in India, as compared to smoking, whether it be uh, smoking itself or secondhand smoke. So I think we must understand that in India, we are seeing a different type of pattern as far as COPD is concerned. So 65% of non-smoking global COPD burden occurs in low and middle income countries. And in, in India, there is a huge burden of COPD, which is non-smoking related. And I think that is something that we need to understand. So if you start looking at the risk factors of COPD, uh, as far as uh, non-smoking is concerned, Biomass exposure is something that has been there for a long time. Papers published almost 30 years ago from PGI Chandigarh actually showed a high risk not only for COPD, but even for lung cancer as far as biomass exposure was concerned in young women who were cooking using uh, solid fuel as far as cooking was concerned. You already know the tuberculosis itself can lead to TOPD, and this can also progress in, into what is uh, classical COPD. Recurrent childhood infections in our population can also lead to uh, obstructive lung disease in later life. And like I've already mentioned, pollution and occupational exposure to smoke are risk factors which are prevalent as far as India is concerned. So India has a different phenotypic presentation as far as COPD is concerned as compared to what we see in the Western world. Also, some data suggests that in Indian patients, there tends to be a high eosinophil count. And this leads to eosinophilic airway inflammation. And that is why it's possible that a larger portion of our patients may be sensitive uh, as far as uh, inhaled corticosteroids are concerned. So patients with high eosinophil count respond better to inhaled corticosteroids. You've just seen that data. And the data from India suggests that we have a tendency to have a high eosinophil count. I sometimes wonder that this could be with, because of recurrent parasitic infection that the Indian population is exposed to which may be also contributing to a high eosinophil count. So if you look at data which is there, and this is data from uh, uh, papers published uh, from our country by Dr. Rajadhar and Dr. Deepak Talwar, which looks at the prevalence, we would find that as far as group D or group E, which is now uh, called, the prevalence of COPD in that varies from 29 to 42%. So large bulk of our patients that we see actually are group E patients rather than the classical group A or group B, which we don't see that much because patients come late, diagnosis gets delayed. And because of that, a large number of patients who get di diagnosed to have COPD are actually group E patients. So that leads us to the rationale of single inhaler triple therapy for Indian COPD patients. One is, like I said, we are a different ETO uh, types, the phenotypes are different we possibly have a higher eosinophilic phenotype. As far as patients is concerned, there's poor awareness, incorrect prescription are, are given, and there is significant non-adherence as far as treatment is concerned. And of course, there is limitation as far as healthcare resources are concerned. So that from that point of view, triple therapy would be useful in patients who are having high eosinophils or having more severe COPD with recurrent exacerbations. It's something that would be useful, and a single inhaler would probably lead to better compliance uh, as far as treatment is concerned. So advantage of SIT basically is that it offers reduced treatment complexities, better adherence, improves outcome uh, in more advanced COPD patients, and of course improves the outcome as we already heard in the CO eosinophilic phenotype. So there is evidence that a combination of fluticasone, formitrol, uh, and glycopyranium would be useful as far as triple therapy is concerned. And this is basically because fluticasone is a potent inhaled corticosteroid, 10 to 100 times more potent than budesonide. Formiterol is a selective beta-2 agonist, long duration of action, and glycopyranium is more selective M3 agonist, 
uh, antagonist. Therefore, it is more use, more effective as far as bronchodilatation is concerned. There is a study which has looked at this and published more recently, which looked at COPD patients. These were current or ex-smokers having uh, post-bronchodilator FEV1 between 30 to 80 percent, but history of at least two COPD exacerbation in the last 12 months and were more severe in terms of the MMRC uh, score in terms of the symptoms. And this was a randomized double-blind active control parallel group study, 20 sites across India, 12-week duration, looking at a fixed single uh, dose inhale, uh, triple therapy with as compared to a multiple inhaler triple therapy. And what the study actually showed was that the exacerbation by, of, a, 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 of a looking, if you looked at at least one exacerbation, it was actually less as in the SIT therapy as compared to the multiple dose inhaler triple therapy. The bronchodilatation was actually quite similar. It was, it was not significantly different in the true in, in the two groups. And in terms of um, serious side effects, the there was less in, uh, incidence of serious adverse effects uh, or adverse effects leading to permanent discontinuation when we look at a single inhaler triple therapy as compared to the multiple inhaler triple therapy, which is the uh, controller arm. So the data, I think, which is more important, suggested that the compliance was much higher when we looked at single uh, inhaler triple therapy as, a, as compared to the multiple inhaler triple, triple therapy. This has already been shown, the, the real-world observation study from Spain, which looked at a large number of patients, almost 4, more than 4,500 patients, showing that when you, when, you, when you look at treatment persistence, exacerbation, mortality, and health care cost, all of them actually are beneficial if you look at a single inhaler triple therapy. So I think what we are trying to say is that single inhaler triple therapy is something that would be advantages for our patients because of multiple factors, the phenotypes that we have, the burden of disease, the delay presentation that our patients uh, have. And this is something that may be useful. It will bring down the mortality, morbidity, and it is something that would be useful in both improving compliance, reducing exacerbation, and mortality, and as data suggests, could lead to saving in healthcare cost as compared to multiple inhaler th triple therapy. So I think the take-home message is that the burden of COPD in our country is significant. It's a different phenotype than what we see in the Western world. And since we do tend to see more of eosinophilic subsets and more severe COPD, there is a role of looking at single inhaler triple therapy in our COPD patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rindeep, sir, for uh, highlighting the differences between COPD in the Indian scenario versus the Western world and pinpointing the role of single inhaler triple therapy with specific focus on non-smoking COPD prevalence in India, as well as the eosinophilic phenotype in India. Uh, I request Dr. Deepak Talwar. I think, sir, again, sir, needs no introduction to this crowd or anywhere, any crowd, any respiratory crowd in India. He's the director and chair pulmonary sleep medicine and critical care medicine at the Metro Institute of Health Sciences in Noida. He's a fellow of the American College of Church Physicians and the National College of Church Physicians, fellow of the Indian Sleep Disorders Association and fellow of the Indian College of Allergy and Immunology. He's, the, he's a role model and he's one of the idealistic teachers we can find in India when it comes to the respiratory medicine field. He's in charge of the DNP respiratory medicine program since 2008 and the fellowship programs in international pulmonology under IAB and ICS. He has published 169 research papers in various index journals. And above all these things, he is a scintillating liar when it comes to the any lectures, and the mere name of him will attract crowds. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rajesh, for those wonderful words. And uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Lupin, for having me here. I want to very quickly go through it because I know people are jumping to ask questions, Randeep, as well as uh, Professor Osmani. So my presentation is very short and very sweet, and it has been made very simple after what Randeep has said. Rajesh, thanks for reminding us that uh, me and Randeep have completed 34 years since we entered PGI Chandigarh. So that's 34 years ago. So it's a long story. The life is going on. Okay. So... <clears throat> uh, Randeep made it very clear that Indian COPD is a predominantly a non-smoking COPD. It is an eosinophilic COPD. 
it is more severe COPD. All three characteristics of a patient who's likely to be a candidate for a using inhaled corticosteroids in COPD. So when I talk about risk versus benefits of uh, IC. I think if you move it fast, yeah, come to the first, yeah. It's okay, I can manage it. It's okay. Okay. So, a uh, 56 year male smoker, worsening dyspnea, having chronic cough, exacerbations, treated with antibiotics and nebulizations, lung functions showing FEV even 40%. And eosinophil count of 290. So the first thought which came to this is immediately this patient was given the same single inhaler triple therapy fixed, which Randeep has already discussed and initiated with good smoking and some exercise and rehabilitation program. So let's see whether this decision is correct or not. You can keep it in your mind. Whether you, would you like to give a triple therapy here or would you like to use a dual therapy? Because I think if we move on to the next slide. Shikhar, you can just move the slide there because yeah. So goal 2023 has made life simple for all of us because there are only two drug combinations available to treat them. Either you use a dual bronchodilator, which is a lava lama combination, or you use a triple therapy, which is just now discussed by Randeep also. And you can see that any patient who is a sicker patient, who is exacerbating patient, who is a more symptomatic patient, will straight away goes to group E. And that's the one where you consider inhaled corticosteroids up front. Up front, when either the patient is having uh, a blood eosinophil count of more than or equal to 300. So any patient who has fit the bill of group E and has an eosinophil count at baseline of more than or equal to 300 is a candidate for triple therapy, right? So this is, this is making life simple rather than going through straight away lava lama to everybody, let them suffer another exacerbation, look at their eosinophil count and then go on to triple therapy, which was in the previous guidelines of update. Uh, of gold. Now it is simpler one that upfront if the blood eosinophil. So if you go back to the, your case, you know, the case showed that 290. So if you go by the numbers, then obviously you will say that this does not fit the bill and should go for a lava lama and not for a triple therapy. Okay, let us see ahead. Those patients who continue to exacerbate, then you have to see that if their blood eosinophil counts are more than or equal to 100, you move on to triple therapy. So there are only two steps involved, dual therapy or a triple therapy. So if triple therapy straight away, fine. If you give double therapy or dual therapy and patient continues to exacerbate, even the eosinophil count of 100 or equal to 100 will make that patient as a candidate for going into a triple therapy. So I think the question only remains is that between a dual bronchodilator and a triple bronchodilator or a triple therapy, the difference is upfront count of eosinophil more than 300. And this patient, I remind again, was nine, uh, sorry, two, 290. So why is an exacerbation so important to choose an inhaled corticosteroid? So that's quite simple because it has been made clear by Professor Osmani as well as Randeep that every exacerbation which happens in a patient means in 50% of them, another exacerbation will come in that ear. 
So if you want to let that exacerbation come and get another 50% chances of an exacerbation, that's your choice. But every exacerbation leads to 37% fostered, faster decline in FEV1 of the patient. So they do lose their lung function faster. They suffer with poor quality of life for nearly about six months. And also there is nearly 50% risk of death in this group of patients in the coming five years. So at a single moderate to severe exacerbation in COPD leads to a risk of death, risk of repeated exacerbation, and of course, more decline in lung functions and poor quality of life. And very important, one exacerbation will lead to another exacerbation in 50% of the patients. Now, who wants to be in that 50% to get another exacerbation before you go ahead and get uh, triple therapy? So the data has been already shown. So this is one snapshot slide, which tells us that adding inhaled corticosteroid to dual bronchodilator not only uh, leads to nearly 30% reduction in exacerbations, but also 30% reduction on an average reduction in mortality. So exacerbations and mortality by and large in all the trials on an average shows reduction by adding inhaled corticosteroids to the dual bronchodilator that is Lama Lama. So converting dual bronchodilator into triple therapy, reduction in exacerbations, reduction in mortality, improvement in quality of life, improvement in symptoms of the patient. Now, <clears throat> adding this, the most important aspect which has come is the reduction in mortality. So if anything talks about that what ICS is going to do in COPD, yeah, we all know that it, it'll, it is decreasing exacerbations, but what is new that it is also reducing the mortality in COPD patients. And I think translating mortality into practice is a hard point. It's a very hard point. You can have another exacerbation and may not die is correct. But if you are talking about mortality, that is what is the aim. If you can tell me any intervention in COPD, which has been able to reduce the mortality, you will come up with only two answers. One, oxygen therapy and two, quit smoking. If third, nearly reaching that is actually the, the suitable candidates who have undergone, LVRS. That's the third group. Besides that, nothing else has shown so far to reduce mortality in COPD. And do you think mortality in COPD is not important? I would say it's perhaps very, very important. Exacerbation translates to mortality, true. But there is other uh, non-respiratory mortality, which is related to cardiovascular mortality in COPD patients. And that is also reduced because we have data to show that and it has been discussed. So reduction in exacerbations, clinical, re clinically relevant. Reduction in rate of decline on FEV1, we do not know how significant if it is, if 20 ml less is lost in one year in comparison to uh, uh, 40 ml. So how much it makes a clinical significance, we do not know. And of course, improvement in health-related quality of life. This all is there. But yes, of course, as I said, the mortality is the important point. But the only downside of using inhaled corticosteroids, which is in our minds ever since the last almost about one and a half decades, is that it causes pneumonia, high risk of developing pneumonias in those patients who are on ICS, and of course, oropharyngeal disease. So we are not bothered about oropharyngeal disease because we know how to take care of it. But pneumonia is something which is being repeatedly coming as a signal of association with the use of inhaled corticosteroids in COPD patients. But reduction in mortality is something which has been now recognized in GOLD 2023, where a clear statement coming out from the two trials, IMPACT and ETHIOS, which has been already discussed by Professor Usmani, which clearly shows that there is reduction in mortality, which was not the primary endpoint, but it was observed in the patients who were followed up in these two trials in which the inhaled corticosteroid group was compared with non-ICS group, which that is Laba Lama group versus the group which had triple therapy with ICS or a dual therapy where a Laba was with the ICS. And both the drugs 
both the groups which had inhaled corticosteroid as a common denominator showed reduction in mortality, making it very clear that the signal is reduction in mortality is related to inhaled corticosteroids, not to LABA and not to LAMA. So that makes, again, this statement from coming from gold in 2023 is the signals are clear that inhaled corticosteroid as a denominator is the signal for reduce mortality in COPD patients. So why? Why the mortality is reduced in the group of patients who receive inhaled corticosteroids? And perhaps some of the reasons which have been seen is reduced hyperinflation demonstrated in impact trial, reduced exacerbations, because exacerbation, I have already told you, 50% mortality after one exacerbation in the next five years. So if you reduce the exacerbations, you reduce mortality also. And that has been seen not only in the impact trial, but also in ethos, chronos, and trilogy. So four trials have shown reduction in exacerbation as a contributory cause could be related to reduction in mortality. Then, of course, very important cardiovascular mortality decrease is related to stabilization of atheromatous plaques due to inhaled corticosteroids, which has been given as a signal from the impact trial. And similarly, better cardiac function more diastolic uh, function, uh, more diastolic uh, uh, function being preserved, as well as improvement in cardiac index in the group of patients who have received triple therapy. Again, in impact trial, it has been shown primarily related to Villantrol combination of Villantrol, particularly in that. So there is a data to suggest that why the mortality is getting reduced by particularly the combinations which are contained inhaled corticosteroids. Of course, there are a couple of trials which failed. So if I take the name of TORCH, the number one trial which failed, and it failed by 0 0.001 only. I think one, one single digit, 0 0.45, uh, 49 to 0.5. That's what was required actually, 0 0.01. And then of course, Uplift trial was also the one which didn't show the benefit. And then there are another one or two trials which are there. But who is the villain in getting pneumonias? Because at the end of the day, we are not able to, you know, uh, you know, clear our doubts regarding connection between use of ICS in COPD patients with a with development of pneumonias. So look at this chart, and it will tell you that number one, inhaled corticosteroids is not the villain only. And if it is there, it is right at the bottom. You can see. What are the bigger ones and which play more role in development of pneumonia and are linked more strongly to development of pneumonia in COPD patients is severity of COPD, so more severe COPD, frequent use of oral corticosteroid use, low BMI, high age groups, and current smokers. So you can see that there are other factors which are responsible and linked to development of pneumonia more frequently than the inhaled corticosteroids use, which is like right at the bottom, which you can see in this uh, chart. Then comes those two questions which were there in the mind. That 300 number, you have to, you know, reach that magic number of 300 to upfront start a triple therapy. Is it very clear that at 300 you need to do? Yes, if you can see that, this is the same impact trial it clearly shows that the lines have got statistically significantly different at 300, but the separation started beyond 100. So what it means is these numbers are fluid. It may change. And if 290 is it today, it does not mean that it is not that sacrosanct 300 where you can actually use the drug. Because eosinophil counts are never so stable that if you do even if a week apart or a couple of days apart or even a day later or hours later, 10 or 20 or 30 numbers can just change because it depends upon the release from the bone marrow. So this number is not so sacrosanct. That is why it starts from 100 when the patients continue to exacerbate and you have nothing else to add. You say, okay, now from dual to triple therapy. Because there is still effect, which is reduction in exacerbation, which starts at 100, becomes statistically significant at 300, and becomes more and more statistically significant beyond 100, 300. So what it means is we are talking about a, a 
condition where blood eosinophil count relationship with ICS effectiveness in reducing exacerbations is a fluid state. It's, it's a continuous state. It continues to improve, but the separation starts at 100. So that's why below 100, it's not recommended. And then when it you use it and you are scared about the pneumonia risk, then the second chart is for you basically, which shows that the risk is predominantly seen in the group of patients who receive high dose inhaled corticosteroid. But what is recommended is medium dose inhaled corticosteroids in COPD. And you can see that that's what is being used. So if you use medium dose inhaled corticosteroids in COPD patients in triple therapy and your eosinophil counts are 300 or near 300, that makes sense as upfront therapy in COPD patients. But this will all be a very little said about ICS add pneumonia risk in COPD patients because it's a very, very complex uh, relationship. Mostly it has been demonstrated with fluticasone and fluticasone compounds. And paradoxically, those patients who are on these compounds and develop pneumonia, they recover much better their mortality rates are less comparison to the group of patients who were not on inhaled corticosteroids. This is a complete paradox. One time you are saying it is causing pneumonia and second time we are finding the signal that this pneumonia is not killing them. Had they been not on inhaled corticosteroid, their pneumonia would have been very severe and they would have got a higher chances of dying because of pneumonia. Then it is also thought as a process in which sometimes very severe exacerbations look like actually pneumonias and they are just prolonged exacerbations which might have been captured in the clinical trials. And uh, as I said that those who are not on inhaled corticosteroid or dual bronchodilators, they also develop pneumonias but they develop more severe pneumonias with more poor outcomes. And of course, some of the trials did not give any kind of a signal that uh, the inhaled corticosteroid use can cause pneumonias. And SUMMIT trial is the biggest trial for that because it did not show any, any flag. It did not raise any red flag on increased in incidence of pneumonias with the use of inhaled corticosteroid, which was again fluticasone furiate in this uh, SUMMIT trial. So in this group, perhaps the patients were not very severe COPD as we know that severe COPD is right on the top, which is actually the most important factor associated with development of future pneumonias in patients of COPD who receive ICS. And finally, there has been concern of using inhaled corticosteroids in the patients who have tuberculosis in the past, which has not been treated. So reactivation of untreated tuberculosis has been a concern. But the important highlight of the day would be that neither this risk has been actually calculated or actually uh, what we say that quantified. It has never been quantified. So we do not know whether it's a real risk or a mythical risk, but this risk has been always discussed. But this risk is not on the table for treated patients of tuberculosis. Those who have not been treated for reactivation, it has been discussed in the past. So going back to the same patient, you can see that this patient comes back and given he was given triple therapy. Do you think it was correct or wrong? I think in the initially when you saw this slide, everybody thought the patient should have received actually a dual bronchodilator. But after listening to the whole story, it seems that this is an individual call and you have to take a call. And in Indian circumstances, what Randeep said is it makes a lot of difference when you take a call because you need adherence. You need a good effect of the triple therapies. You also need to see that the many exacerbations in India go completely unnoticed because patients are in the habit of refilling their prescriptions. The last prescription which carried an antibiotic and an oral steroids at, the, at any small amount of exacerbation which patient suffers, which may be viral or pollution induced, the immediate next step is to take the same medications again and they take that they become all right and they forget about and they never talk about it to us in the hospital busy OPDs to tell us what was the exact number of exacerbations. So I always take exacerbation, a hard point, the one which has caused hospitalization. But the problem is in India, lot of exacerbations which actually deserve hospitalization get treated at home. 
because of the various factors. And one of the important factor will be the financial restraints, which we are put forward for every admission. One admission of acute exacerbation of COPD in a private hospital will not charge the patient less than 1 lakh of rupees. So one exacerbation is a very, very expensive thing to happen for a patient of COPD. So this patient has six months is doing good. And now at this point of time, you know, there is a discussion whether the ICS should be continued or we can actually withdraw the ICS. So the only last slide which I want to show you is this. That when your patients are on triple therapy and you are now discussing with the patient, because this is a very common scenario happening that patient comes back, that my orthopedic guy says you are using inhaled corticosteroids, so you should take care of it because your bones are getting weaker. Another one comes in and says that my eyes are getting bad, I am getting cataract, I am getting glaucoma. I know that six months of ICS has not caused it, but then the concern has been raised. So where there would be a concern that can you take this patient off the inhaled corticosteroids because six months has passed and he's doing fairly well. Of course, you can see all have got different recommendations. Gold says de-escalate when the patient develops pneumonia. Consider de-escalation when the patient gets admitted with a pneumonia. And that point you think that is pneumonia because of ICS use. And if you feel so, then you can de-escalate the patient by bringing down from triple to dual bronchodilator therapy. Then ATS recommendation says discontinue if the patient does not have any exacerbation for one complete year. That makes a lot of sense in India because most of the exacerbations will be clustered around particular part of the year, particularly in the north. It may not be in the south, but in the north. You know, we'll have a lot of exacerbations which will come during the winter months, during the pollution months, during the change of seizures, and of course related to viral exacerbations as well as air, wave, air pollution which happens in, in, in this part of the world. So if that part is not covered during those six months, then you can never say that this patient will not have exacerbation. He may have it in the next six months. So one year makes a lot of sense when we look at the ATS recommendation. And finally, the ERS recommendation is that when you are trying to switch to dual bronchodilators from triple therapy, look at the AAC count. It, it should be less than 300 and patient should not be having any frequent exacerbation. So if that is satisfied, then only you can downgrade the patient from triple to dual therapy. You can use any of them, but the most important thing is these are moderate quality evidence and there are conditional evidences. So conditional means nearly 50% of the patients, when they are chosen, they will say that this is okay for me. So that is conditional. So basically you discuss with the patient is okay for you because you are concerned about inhaled corticosteroid. I am concerned about exacerbation. If you are ready to accept that, we can go ahead down. But otherwise, we would like to stick on and wait for some more time for that patient. With that, I would like to thank you all for patiently listening to me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Deepak, sir, for clearing the air about concerns of ICS use in COPD. You have very clearly made us understand that uh, in a properly selected patients, the benefits clearly outweigh the risks involved. So after your lecture, most of us feel much more confident, feel much more confident of using ICS for the properly selected patients. So we had a, a very scintillating one wonder of our session where we heard Professor Usmani talking, Randeep sir talking. The books are talking. So I know there are 16 satellite centers or regional centers where we have a moderator, we have a couple of speakers, and I think this program is so designed that the regional centers are going to have a small lecture of their own speakers. So the best interest of time, I think everyone is looking forward to interacting with uh, Professor Usmani, the books are, and all, 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 of, all of us. And then uh, in the best interest of time, I would request all senders to be very short and restrict your interactions to carefully selected one question or maximum two questions. And in case the, if the regional moderators and speakers feel that after the interaction is finished, they want to go ahead with their own lecture series, they are very free to do so. So uh, probably I think, sir, Deepak, sir, can we start with one interaction from from 
sir we are just starting our interaction sir with the 16 satellites and regional centers as well as delhi uh, so we'll just start off the discussion with one question from uh, delhi hub uh, it's very clear from the gold guidelines and from the lecture of all of you that in those copd cases where uh, inhaled steroids are required you always prefer a single inhaler triple therapy is there any individual clinical scenario where you think uh, multiple inhaler therapy would be worthwhile in a particular patient because of any of any any reason i think i'll just put it across to professor usmani and uh, then deepak sir also um so actually i think over the last um 20 years we've um you know the value of single inhaler really with and you've heard this from uh, Randeep, you've heard this from uh, uh, Deepak, both very empowering lectures, um, and I think the three of us fitted in very nicely, it is the ability that it's simple, patients get it, and they have more chance of adhering to the treatment. So, um, so why complicate matters for our patients by giving them two or three different devices, plus a spacer, plus probably a nebulizer, plus probably oral tablets, they will start using the wrong inhalation maneuver from the wrong devices. So we may feel that we're giving them three separate devices, but the reality is they're using the wrong inhalation maneuver, they're getting differences in deposition, and therefore they're getting differences in effect. It's very difficult to manage this in a very busy clinical context. So I would, I would actually say probably not, and maybe that's a pro-con debate we should have at the ERS for next year. So I'm always collecting ideas, but I'll hand you back to um, to the thoughts maybe from Randeep or, or indeed Deepak. I think Randeep has, uh, sir, has uh, left because of some personal commitment. Deepak sir is very much here. Sir, your your words on that? Exactly. What do you, what do you want to ask me? <laughs> no, what I was trying to ask was, sir, is there any particular clinical scenario where we prefer multiple inhaler triple therapy as opposed to single inhaler because most of the scenarios it will be the norm of the okay. day so open triple basically yes. you are asking yes. so at the moment if i look at it uh, you know why would i like to use an open triple because number one the drugs are not available which are there in the single inhaler triple therapy so that would be the first reason to do it second reason perhaps would be that uh, you know some of the patients might be not able to afford if the triple therapy in a single inhaler is an expensive one. So that's the second reason I can think of in an Indian scenario. Uh, if 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 I, I think back in the last six months or one year, what was a uh, what was one single thing which was holding us back to use that was primarily some of the drugs were not available in the PMDI. Some of them were only available in the DPI and the combinations could not be made in a way where it could be used in a single inhaler, right? So they were all open, open triple therapies available. So that is absolutely, I think what Professor Osmani has brought is why make things so messy and difficult for the patients who are already at the verge of non-adherence. There is a this disease, when we talk about obstructive airway disease, then adherence is a part and parcel of it, that we need it. And we expect every patient in one time or the other will become non-adherent. And the only thing which we have really seen to show such a beautiful results is when you give everything in one particular device, you don't have to teach them two different. Because I think if you give uh, dry powder inhaler and then you give PMDI also with another drug in open that, that's like killing to the patient because he is not able to use A device, B device, and he's going to be confused. And at the end of the door, whichever gives him quick relief, he will keep using that and forget about the rest of it. So if that is there, I think the the luckily, as far as India is concerned, cost will not be such a big factor because it is ultimately being now produced by so many companies. Only question will be single inhaler, triple therapy once a day or twice a day. I think that will be the thing which we should be discussing in future. But that is the future of management of obstructive airway diseases. There's no doubt about it. I think the message is very strong from both the experts that by and large, in most of the cases, if not all, select a single inhaler triple therapy. So uh, we open it to the Delhi hub. So any any we can take one question to the experts. 
and then we have to move to the regional centers also yes sir Hello, my compliments to the uh, eminent speakers, Professor Swani, Dr. Venkat, Dr. Gleria, and Dr. Talwar, sir. So, my sim uh, simple question is if we are giving ICS for exacerbations, do we usually advise some antibiotic support also with that? Some antibiotic support during exacerbation to prevent further exacerbations. Okay, so I think what you are asking is that uh, do we use uh, the prophylaxis yes. antibiotics yes. to reduce their exacerbations, yes. right? So azithromycin is the one which is recommended in the gold. And uh, in our practice, we generally first try to see whether the triple therapy is able to do the job or not. And those patients who continue to exacerbate even on triple therapy, we choose between rofilomilast and azithromycin. I know India doesn't like rofilomilast at all. And most of the 99% of the physicians are unhappy with rofilomilast. But I am personally not unhappy at all because neither I have seen intolerance nor the weight loss. But uh, yes, some, uh, most of the people don't accept that. So azithromycin is given 500 milligram three times a week. But that is only in the setup once the triple therapy patient exacerbates on triple therapy also. So okay. that's how we use it. I think Professor Osmani is there. He yeah. will we'll take his comment. No, very much like yourself. So I use Riflumilast as well. I use azithromycin very much in the gold directive, as you've outlined, um, Dr. Telval Deepak. Um, and um, um, yeah, and if I mean, you know, in the scenario that you present, that's exactly what we would do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. One more thing is uh, any special monitoring or uh, in cases of uh, latent diabetic or pre-diabetic cases, if, if they are taking ICS in diabetes patients, any special monitoring or care to be taken for that? So, or we can give ICS for months together in these cases. Okay, I'll, I'll pass this question to Dr. Osmani that uh, do we need to monitor their sugars for uh, diabetic patients? So, uh, so scientifically, we know that inhaled corticosteroids cause metabolic upset, and we know that there have been three or four studies now. David Price showed a very large um, study whereby um, the higher the dose of your ICS, the more the tendency for metabolic upset and the duration of therapy, 18 months and beyond. So we've got to be cognizant that we know that with pneumonia, there are other attendant effects of ICS, including osteoporosis, including cataracts, including Including, including diabetes. Um, and if a diabetic patient is given an inhaled corticosteroids, I wouldn't add any more to their routine monitoring. They will notice that there'll be some fluctuation. Potentially, it may not just be due to the ICS. There may be other attendant factors that is causing their metabolic upset. But I wouldn't um, uh, uh, dictate an increased regimen um, unless they were a very unstable diabetic, possibly. And there it comes back. I liked your slide, um, Deepak, really. And it just goes to show you've got to put a case by case basis because you have guidelines, you have directives. But that whole slide that you put about ICS pneumonia and the complexities, then you touched on TB, then you touched on the fact that it may be persistent exacerbations. And pneumonia, by definition, is consolidation on a chest radiograph. And when you actually look at the studies, not all of them had consolidation on a chest radiograph. And if you go back 30 years, we actually used to give oral corticosteroids for pneumonia in, and presepsis in ICU. I appreciate the studies have now shown that that's not the right thing to do. So there's a lot to be done, and it's down to us to be able to synthesize it when we have the patient sitting in front of us. So no increased regimen required unless you have an unstable patient. Yeah. I think, so I think in Indian context, what makes difference is a lot of our diabetic patients are actually already uncontrolled. So in those patients, it definitely makes a sense, you know, to just be online with them to not only look for diabetes, but also look for their osteoporosis and the eye cataracts, which are again, very important and very frequently overlooked in a busy practice. So I think we need to remember that uh, whatever corticosteroids we are giving, so at least we have an annual monitoring of these patients because we know that you know COPD patients are osteoporotic also. But then we hardly ever ask for DEXA scans for them patients. We never ask for the histories. We never do those things. So I think it's it makes us also more, uh, uh, in a way, giving a wholesome approach to these patients by looking at their comorbidities and addressing them before they tell us we're picking them up. 
but this is obviously not possible for every patient but then obviously some of the patients who are really bad would require that kind of so the messages from both experts are that go on an individual basis there are some people who are very sensitive and then someone who is unstable to begin with be more cautious in them and at least someone who is requiring high dose of steroids be more cautious so with that words because we have multiple senders i may be permitted La to move to a lastly one thing i you... think sir we can just because both the speakers are there we can just interact I think you with can them come in the last you take the centers otherwise yes. you won't be able to yes. take the centers so uh, can we, we take, connect to coaching we'll come in the last we'll last we'll we'll come back we'll come can back. we connect coaching dr subin dr subin dr pravin dr paramesh are you there dr subin so this is coaching uh, coaching please unmute yourself Are you unmuted? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Subin, you are audible. Yeah, please. thank you so much. Greetings from Kochi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful session. It was very lovely, and uh, we stuck to time as well, and it was really enlightening as well. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Osmani. Thank you so much, Deepak Talwar sir. Thank you so much, Kuleria sir, and our own Rajesh sir. Uh, just one quick question since we are running behind time. Uh, so it, is, it has been proven beyond doubt that single inhaler triple therapy has come to stay and it's the future of COPD treatment. Uh, I definitely do agree with that point. But in the West, we have these uh, really effective delivery devices like uh, Respimat and uh, Ellipta devices, uh, which is proven, uh, their worth is proven. But in India, uh, I just want to ask how efficacious is the drug delivery for a severe COPD gold E patient with the current drug delivery de devices we have. We just have a dry powder inhaler for formulations in India now. So that is my question, uh, especially to Talwar, sir. I think Subin has brought I, up. I think, uh, you know, you have hit the nail very correctly and bringing this point that we are trying to translate the results of ethos and uh, impact trials with the different devices, with the different drug combinations. And uh, we are translating that into an Indian practice. But the question is that, uh, you know, right now you are correct that we have a dry powder in Of course, uh, Ellipta is available, very much uh, available in India. But yes, recipe mat is not available. The only question which I have, I have asked myself again and again, the same thing as you said, that whether our dry powder inhalers are equally good in efficiently delivering the device or not. But uh, I think uh, in the last uh, couple of years, we have been discussing about the inspiratory flow rates and the dry powder inhaler use. And we did find that only about 25% of patients at the time of discharge from the hospital have suboptimal peak inspiratory flow rate. And even after exacerbations, like almost two thirds of patients are able to use a dry powder inhaler effectively. So the drug and delivery and of course the patient, all three are the uh, you know equal partners in this. So I do understand that point, but uh, at the cost difference, I would definitely be inclined to say that, that we haven't found that our devices are in any way inferior to what we are using the other ways. So I'm very happy with it. And uh, I know that it will look a little more pragmatic to you, but I'm sure that you are also using it and quite happy with it. <laughs> Yeah, so I think Deepak sir is telling that uh, he's quite happy and probably that's our own experience. I think uh, Professor Usmani, any comment? So, so don't get me started. This is my area, isn't it? But, you know, I think um, uh, uh, Dr. Talva Deepak put it very succinctly, very pragmatically, discussed the three elements, the drug, the device, and the patient interaction. And what we need to recognize is, is that Every ICS is different, every LABA is different, every LAM is different. Deepak mentioned differences in potency and, um, um, and, and the glucocorticoid receptor causing efficacy, but also adverse events. Differences in devices, in spiritual flow, you've got low, low, medium, 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 high, high resistance devices, and you need to engage engage the patient. And the other thing is COPD patients who are hyperinflated, one big tip is make sure they exhale fully before they inhale fast. If they exhale hyperinflated, they are not going to achieve the inspiratory flow rate that's important. So get them to exhale as fully as they can to residual volume before they take that fast oomph through the powder. But you know, uh, that's I just in terms of time, that's all I'm going to say. I think Deepak managed to say it all.
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. We, Thank you so quickly, much. We quickly move to the Chennai hub where Professor Dhanasekar is there. Can we connect to Chennai hub, Professor Dhanasekar? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening from Chennai. Uh, we had a wonderful talk from the three eminent speakers. And uh, from our side, is there a, whether the glycoparinium dosage, it's a 12.5 milligram BD and uh, whether it is 50 milligram or 25 milligram BD will be helpful. Is there any point to say from that? But I knew it was coming. <laughs> So, so pharmacologically, these doses have all been looked at, as you know, and you quite rightly described the three different doses. And going through preclinical, through clinical, and through pharmacological, and looking at provocation measures. So, so, and you can apply this to the different llamas. You can apply this to the different llamas. Even going back to formotrol, twenty-five years ago, and looking at um, giving formotrol as a long-acting, not looking at the FEV one, but doing bronchial provocation challenges with histamine. So, so the question is that you've got the dose is in combination with a LABA and in combination with an ICS, and collectively they have they act in a complementary manner. Naturally, they are all working at three different receptors. And the key thing here is you want to make sure that the device you choose actually delivers the drug in homogeny to the receptors. You don't have one bit flying to the right upper lobe, one bit flying to the left lower lobe, and one bit flying to the middle lobe. So to actually achieve the, um, the, 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 the complementary action. So I hope I've answered the question if I've understood it correctly. I think the more that we talk about it, you know, we realize that as respiratory physicians, we actually, it's a really complex job that we do. Yeah. It's not like some of our other colleagues who maybe just have a very focused area. We've really got to listen to the patient. We've really got to know our drugs. We've really got to know our devices. And that that slide that was shown by Dr. Galeria of all the different devices, it's great for innovation. But we have to make sense of it when we've got that patient in front of us. And, and that, I think, was um, eloquently picked up by Dr. Talwa in his lecture. Anything to add, sir? So I think uh, this is a question which is an eternal question because when you look at the US FDA and you look at e, uh, EMA, uh, glycoparinium once a day, glycoparinium twice a day, the dose 25, dose 50. So this has been all discussed, uh, you know, when it's standalone uh, glycoparinium, but once it gets combined with another LABA, whether it is an indocatrol or it is like in a triple combination with fluticazone or with uh, butosunide, then these molecules interact. And I think uh, nobody better than Professor Osmani could have, have made it clear that there's a complex interaction between the molecules, which finally gives you the output of that uh, combination. And that which once has been gone through a various, uh, you know, developmental stages only has reached where it is clinically significant, improving the outcomes that it is available to us. So I think individual patient uh, demand, whether it's twice a day or once a day, depends upon you to see that. But yes, it is available and that that will be determined by you looking at your patient and the patient's requirements and perhaps might have to change it over the next time. It's not necessary what you have chosen today is for the rest of the life, actually. I think patient dictating his demands as to how much his uh, you know, breathlessness is troubling it and how much medication is going to be effective. I think that decision has to be taken by us on a sometimes may not be correct on the first go. It might have to be revised uh, you know, on a subsequent visit. Yeah, thank you, sir. So we need to have we have an individualized approach as well as keep on monitoring the patient for effects as well as adverse effects. So thanks, uh, Chennai team, Chennai hub for uh, joining us. And uh, those hubs uh, whose questions are finished, they are free to move ahead with their own sessions if they feel so, or if they feel they can continue to be with us. We move to Mumbai where we have Dr. Lancet Pindo. Dr. Pindo. Uh, Professor Usmani, th thank you for a, a, a really from... lucid talk. Uh, my question was uh, that the benefit uh, in mortality, does it also track with the eosinophils, uh, like the benefit with exacerbations, or is it independent of the eosinophil levels? Yeah, no. So there's some very interesting data that's being looked at that, and looking at the higher eosinophil count, and it's linking with the exacerbations uh, and the, the, uh, as a composite to mortality. So 
you know, we've got to realize that things aren't isolated and um, things are interconnected here. And I think understanding things at a composite level, because I come back to the point again that Deepak made is translating mortality to our patient in the clinic and knowing that if we're going to give somebody a treatment and preventing that exacerbation in the long term, will that happen? And what we need for that is a primary outcome study based on mortality that is comparing treatments. And that will be down to the pharmaceutical companies to do that. Whether they do that, I'm not sure. The people that could mandate it is the FDA, because as you remember, 15 years ago, the FDA mandated that the companies compare different LABAs because they were very concerned about LABA and mortality, and they made that mandation. So it could be mandated. And, and I, you know, even at the ERS, and, 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 and maybe some of you will be there this year, and, and you know that I'm heavily involved, but we had a very big discussion about, yes, we see the mortality signal. How do we assess mortality in our patients with COPD? The cardiologists do it very well. They've had 40 years of experience. How do we assess it? And then how do we know that giving them that treatment in the long run will be beneficial? And I do come back to the point, it's hard in respiratory because no treatment is static, no decision is static, no intervention is static. As Deepak said, it has to be reviewed every time. And whether we don't like hearing that, it's what we need to do innately. We need to review every time what's happening with that patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancet. Uh, thank you for a very, very relevant question, which has not been discussed till now. So th thank you, Mumbai region and Mumbai Hub for joining us. We move to Kolkata, where we have Professor A.G. Goshal, a very senior person, a teacher to most of us. Goshal, sir, good evening. And we look forward to your uh, queries and interactions, sir. Sir, I think you are muted, sir. Goshal, sir, I think you are muted. We move to uh, Lucknow, where we have again Professor Suryakant. Sir, a very senior person. Suryakant, sir. Thank you very much. Question of attitude and. So, I really want to congratulate the Lincoln for this wonderful academic event. And we have a lot of questions from the Lucknow Center. To summarize them, the question number one is. Can we step down in place of stopping ICS if the exhibitions are not there and it's not now? Are not, number one. Number two, what is your take of this cycle uh, and therapy? Uh, what do you believe? Two questions. The first question was that, sir, from Surigan, sir, was that rather than stopping inhaled steroids, can we step down inhaled steroids as opposed to stopping? That is what Sir asked. Yes. So the wisdom trial, basically we are discussing about the wisdom trial where you go down on the dose of innate corticosteroids. But I think I forgot to mention in my ERS guidelines for the withdrawal of ICS, first thing you should be sure is that it is not asthma. You should not be committing an error by taking the ICS off in a patient who has got an asthma. So be very sure that you are dealing with COPD, not with asthma. As far as redu reduction is concerned, the wisdom trial did tell us that over six months time, you can reduce the dose of inhaled corticosteroids by making it 50% in first three months and then taking it off slowly. And uh, that gives perhaps a little more confidence to the physicians that they are not knocking off steroids completely and uh, they, are, they are doing it in a stepwise fashion. So <clears throat> that's something what we, what we practice, but uh, uh, I do not know how much it translates into real practice or a real world. We find no difference actually. If, if you are really very clear that you want to get this ICS off, then you'll be able to get it off. But uh, many a times, I think if you look at the ATS guidelines, they are very clear that wait for a little longer, let one year pass. And as far as India is concerned, I'm sure that uh, in every case, at least I'll give one year before uh, taking the ICS off. Any, any words from uh, Professor Osmani? 
in, 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 in the interest of time and not for duplication when we're both concordant in the same answer, um, my approach in the UK also is to go for one year. I initially mentioned three, four, six months, but the key thing is, is to go for a year, um, very much based on the different exposures that patients may have. Um, and um, uh, and but cognizant that he is, if the eosinophil count remains higher than 300, then I would probably be reluctant to do that. Uh, any further questions, Vedigan, sir? So, uh, good evening, doctors. Uh, Lupin Respira Specialty Care welcomes you to the Mentor Connect uh, once again at Regional Chapter Mumbai. Next. Okay. Can we go to the next center, uh, Calicut, where we have Professor Ravindran? Ravindran, sir, good evening. I think center is muted. Good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Now you are audible. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spani, Dr. Talwar, and Dr. Guleria, and Dr. Rajesh for the excellent presentations. Uh, we have a group of uh, chest specialists here. Uh, my question is to Dr. Talwar. Uh, in India, we have both DPI and MDI as triple drug combinations. Which one you prefer? Thank you, Dr. Ravindran, for asking me. But, uh, you know, I have somehow, uh, you know, grown up from my PGI days with the PMDIs as my always the device of choice with <laughs> Spacer. <laughs> and uh, over the years, I have... I have. I was actually never believing in a dry powder inhalers till the time we got indocatrol and glycoperinium, where I realized that the dry powder inhalers do magic also to the patients and easier perhaps to use. And then spacer is not required because spacer becomes a little cumbersome for them. The newer devices which are coming with dry powder inhaler, and especially now most of this uh, um, triple therapies are coming in dry powder inhalers. They are quite comfortable in using it. And I would say that uh, practice has shifted to almost about one third with dry powder inhaler with two thirds with still with PMDIs as far as COPD is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Ravindran sir. And uh, we move to the next center, uh, next hub, that's uh, Patna. Dr. Devendra Kumar. Sir, are you there, sir? From Patna. Hello. Are you audible? Yeah, yes, sir. You are audible. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the wonderful talk by one of the three speakers. So, I have just one query. Uh, what is the role of this combination of the sizes, Rava, Rama, in the treatment of uh, asthma at any stage, like uh, step three, four, in the this state? And if you are giving this uh, combination therapy, then what about the reliever medication in that case? Uh, sir, can you just repeat your question, sir? What I understood was the role of the triple in asthma. That's what you mean. In meant. asthma. Yeah. And the second question is that uh, uh, will you ever use this combination of these uh, three drugs in the treatment of COPD with a normal eosinophilic? So non eosinophilic COPD who are having a frequent activation with this uh, double therapy of nomotalator, will you mm -hmm. use this combination of this triple therapy or will not be use it at uh, any stage of this uh, uh, COPD treatment? Okay, sir. The question that I got was uh, the triple role of triple in asthma and the role of triple in low eosinophilic COPD patient, whether we still continue to use if the eosinophilic is low and then the patient has frequent exacerbations. <laughs> I leave the difficult one for Professor Osmani to how to use triple therapy in low eosinophil counts. What are those patients? But uh, in as far as asthma is concerned, Dipender, now the GINA guidelines are very clearly moving towards, uh, you know, step four, bringing Lama there and, uh, you know, trying to maintain the dose of uh, inhaled corticosteroid in the medium range rather than going to high dose and then adding a Lama. So that makes, the, you know, all these combinations, which are with medium dose inhaled corticosteroids and a Lama and Lama, as a choice for patients of asthma who are in step four therapy, actually. And that is off label for a couple of, uh, you know, uh, single inhaler triple therapies in India. But of course, because these are the ones which are easier to use and safer to use for these patients. And before actually jacking up their dose of uh, inhaled corticosteroids, I would also be happy to use them and we are using them, which is at the moment, I would say off label because in uh, these triple therapies at this moment are for COPD in India. 
I think I'll pass this to Professor Usmani. Yeah, so with respect to asthma, there are in Europe, and there are differences between Europe and United States, there are two licensed therapies now with triple therapy and um, um, uh, for asthma, and at the indication that you have clearly um, stated. With respect to the second question, the definition of non-eosinophil, I think if we are sticking to the goal directive, you see that cutoff of 300 and you see the cutoff of 100. And clearly, if you're eosinophil count and you're on a dual bronchodilator more than 100 and you had an exacerbation, you should consider triple therapy. I think that was very clear in all our three talks. If you are less than 100 and you call that non-eosinophilic, then you should just be on a dual bronchodilator, plus or minus other attendant drugs if you feel you need to use them, such as riflumilast or azithromycin, but you wouldn't consider an ICS at this moment in time in that group. So that's the way that I would um, answer the question in terms of eosinophil and non-eosinophil. There's very interesting work also being done on um, a low eosinophil count if it's less than 0.05. Now, you know, sometimes we only get the count to one decimal place, but people are looking at 0.05. And there's a U-shaped curve in the sense that the lower the eosinophil count, then there's more a risk that you have a problem with, believe it or not, pneumonia. So this is very interesting data that's coming out and has been out for the last year and will be presented at the ERS. So I hope succinctly we've answered both your questions. Thank you both experts for clarifying that part so perfectly. Uh, we move to the next hub that is Nagpur. Uh, we are so sorry that we have to keep you waiting for uh, lack of time. So Nagpur team, uh, Dr. Akash Balki and team. Nagpur team, I think you are muted. Hello? Yeah, I think you are audible. Yes. Uh, thank you, Talwar sir. I am always your fan. <laughs> so... Uh... You have always been, you have, in a, one of the slides, it was been mentioned that ICS, uh, the reduction of ICS dose uh, in patients of pneumonia. So uh, when we are talking about SITT, how is that possible to reduce the dose when, uh, when we don't have any combinations? I personally feel uh, it's available. So uh, you'll shift to dual therapy and then low dose of ICS or, or what's <laughs> you put me in a very tight spot actually you know I think with the are... triple therapy we have no way of taking the ICS slowly so it's either all or none so you immediately go back to your dual bronchodilator therapy because adding an ICS in a different form and making the you know the entire uh, prescription more complex I would in my situation, you know, I would reconsider whether I want to take the ICS out or not. And if I'm convinced that it has to go out, then I will take it at a one strike. I will not go down like that. The 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 kind of you do with the wisdom trial. That's not possible with the single inhaler triple therapy, but it's only possible with open label triple therapies. So, so probably that is one maybe very, very, very small indication where you use open yeah but this is very uncommon yeah. well, like I, if i do not know if you ask all pulmonologists in india that how many times you have really down uh, this thing your patients from triple to dual therapy in copd it would be that uh, it's not more than 10% of patients and the most important reason when you do is that you think that initially it was given by mistake it was wrong i think that's the most common reason to take it off uh, rather than patients improving to an extent where you think that it can be taken off. And if that kind of a response comes, then I, I really go back and think that, is it asthma? I am missing somewhere here. Maybe it is an asthma flavor here that uh, led to such a dramatic response in the patient. And then I will say, stay back with the ICS. Don't leave ICS there. Very correctly put across, sir. Uh... Can we move to the next step, Nagpur? Thank you so much for waiting for us. Uh, we move to Ghaziabad. Ghaziabad hub. I think you are muted. Ghaziabad. Yeah. Yeah, I think now you are. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, I think, already discussed uh, discussed a lot of uh, complex questions. And though we had a lot of questions, but uh, most of it is, it is already answered. But uh, we have two more questions with us, which is unanswered. And the first question from uh, it's from Dr. Sonisha Gupta. Uh, what is the role of uh, biologics uh, in COPD? She is, she wants to ask. Uh, though we have a role in asthma, of course, in step five, 
uh, we see all the biomarkers and then we decide to step up. <laughs> Do you think that uh, there can be or there is a role and it is coming in India? <laughs> Thank you, Kanishk, for bringing this. You know, everybody has heard about the breaking news, map in phase three trial, and uh, data has been already presented in the ATS. So we are all looking forward to it. The molecule is not available in India, even for off-label use. So I'll pass this question to Professor Osmani. Yes, it was talked about a lot, as you say, um, Deepak, at the ATS. So um, it, I think the data only just came out a couple of days before it was then presented at the ATS. So I think people are getting there. So, you know, where we are, there is a lot of, um, we're looking at the data, we're looking at it carefully, we're looking at the study design, we're looking at the patients. Um, in the UK, every biologic has to go to a panel, the panel has to decide, there are cost implications. Um, as you know, we have the National Health Service, so we need to make sure that it's um, there's a cost benefit analysis that's done. I appreciate it's different in different parts of the world. So it's there. And I'm sure um, we will be talking about biologics soon. How far? Probably three or four years away, I think. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's a very good news, actually. You know, we are looking forward to a more solutions in these patients. And then maybe two to three years down the line, we might be having biologics. Already, India has done good on severe asthma. Once it comes in COPD, at least there will be more hope for these patients. And I think the eosinophilic story of COPD will continue that. And maybe we will get more options. There are more drugs on the, on the board. But the data is very convincing, Sunisha. Uh, all the 12 secondary endpoints met, primary endpoint met. I think it was a, it was a amazing results. But of course, they are duplicating it with another trial, which is supposed to come in next six months' time. And if two of them seal the results, then obviously we know that where we are heading for the next next year in 2024. So the options are rosy for COPD patients also, sir. So the, thank you, Ghazia Badha, for staying back. And we moved to Hyderabad uh, region. Dr. Gangadhar Reddy is there. Dr. Gangadhar, sorry for keeping you waiting. Hyderabad. Hyderabad is available or... Uh, sir, they are facing some issue. Okay. Vizag? Okay. I think it's not there. So, Kolkata, I think we failed to connect to Kolkata because they had the regional chapters that was already started. I think they are going on with the regional chapters. So, uh, I think we failed to take some questions from Delhi. So, there was a question there. I think we can take that question now. There's one, there's one at the so, back. Then you can. I think we can take, sir. We have time. Huh? You can you take can. two, three, sir. Yeah, yeah. you can okay. take. Then is that? Is there any role of anti-allergic medications like leucitazine, monoclonal, and it is normally seen in a prescription? Okay. Okay. So I think uh, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer in COPD uh, background because the uh, role of uh, allergy and anti-allergics in COPD will be defining a very specific group where there is an overlap of allergy in COPD. So, you know, in, in, in my practice, I would be looking at those patients who have a background of allergy and they are smokers, they have developed COPD or they have other factors to develop COPD where their symptoms are also related to like allergic component, which may be cough and sputum production, upper upper airway symptoms. So in those situations, I would be using it. But per se in COPD, using a montelukast, levocitrizine, fexofenadine does not make any sense. Thank That's you. my my take on it. We have Professor Osmani's opinion also on yeah. that. Professor Osmani. Uh, the same, same, same for sure. I mean, you know, we would... Allergy doesn't naturally go into COPD, but you get patients who are allergic and you get patients who are COPD. We get that, yeah? And therefore, it's symptomatology driven. And again, they may have high IgE. They, you know, if I've got a patient like that, I then start to think, okay, have I missed asthma? So, uh, and are there nasal polyps? And is there eczema? And is there a family history? You know, one goes down that path, but you do see isolated allergy in some COPD patients. But really, I mean, I see that it's really minimal. Sir, I think you had one more question, sir. 
Sir, many uh, many pulmonologists are prescribing uh, bronchodilators, especially acyprofrilin, in in addition to the inhalation therapy in COPD and asthma. A word about that, please, from you. Okay, so uh, this question is uh, Professor Usmani related to acyprofrilin, which is like a muco regulator. To some extent, we we use it for uh, those patients who are more bronchitic type, where they have a lot of uh, mucus production, unable to bring out with little thick mucus, where you want to improve improve the mucociliary action and uh, utilize it in those group of patients. So it's a particular phenotype where you find that, you know, there is a issue in, uh, you know, bringing out the phlegm primarily because of the, uh, the, the mucociliary action as well as the sputum viscosity being the major factor involved in it. So only subtype of like, I will say a phenotype where we use rest, I will uh, pass it to uh, Professor Osmani. Yeah, so in the UK, we have carbocysteine, and carbocysteine we will use in our patients who have this phenotype, who are mucus producing. Again, we go back to the classic emphysematous patient who's mainly breathless, and we have the chronic bronchitic patient who's bringing up mucus and bringing up a lot of phlegm. And in addition, not just drugs, but we will use a flutter device. So we're starting to use flutter devices as a positive expiratory pressure device. Our physiotherapists use this a lot. And, um, and uh, it, it more so than nebulized saline, actually, at times. So for mucus clearance, we have the three treatments, carbocysteine, a flutter device, and nebulized saline. And we tend to start off with flutter devices, and then we will consider carbocysteine. So that's our practice, um, Deepak. I, I don't know if that's yours. Yeah, so I, I think uh, just to inform everyone that uh, flutter devices are already available in India also. And we also have a saline, which is 3% and 7%. Both of them are available for nebulization purposes, which primarily we are using in a bronchiectatic patients. But some patients who have got COPD with this kind of a bronchitis issues, which related to mucus. And even if you look at their CT scans, you will find a lot of mucus impaction there. There is a bronchial wall thickening. They are not able to handle the mucus. So in these patients, same, uh, you know, things have to be done. Give them saline nebulizations, give them uh, flutter devices, help them to regulate it. And carbocysteine, unfortunately, is no longer available in India, if I'm correct. I don't think so. There was only one company making, they have also withdrawn it completely. So the only ones which are available to us are perhaps this uh, N-acetyl cysteine and of course we have in combination with acyprofilin which is available to that. So I do not know whether they are equally effective or not. There are no trials to suggest that. The trials are very small and of course uh, you know it's an individual decision and an individual call. Any further queries from I think Ronak wasn't uh, Ronak please. Thank you, sir. So probably I'm going to ask you to increase the workload. There was a very recent paper that uh, in the patient who has been uh, admitted with exacerbations, if they had referral of pulmonologist, they got very good outcomes. So I think, sir, we are also working on guidelines on COPD and like there are guidelines for heart failure, MI, stroke. So two things, sir, whether pulmonologist intervention or referral should be part of exacerbation management. And second thing, whether SITT would, would have a chance or would have a role in that, it can be reflected as a part of discharge checklist or something like if you talk about heart failure, we have four pillars. So if we have any patient admitted, admitted with severe exacerbations, so SITT should feature that for better outcome or not. I would like to know about it. No question. Sir, uh, what, Ronak, sir, what Ronak meant was patients with COPD exacerbations who are seen and treated by pulmonologists have better outcomes. So is it <laughs> he's asking whether Pulmonology consultation should be made mandatory for COPD exacerbations. I think that's something not to be discussed here. I think this has two parts. One part is a philosophy, right? And second is a reality. So if you talk about a philosophy, any acute exacerbation which is severe enough to require hospitalization would definitely require a pulmonologist opinion to take on board because we feel that the amount of steroids used to treat them is like mega dosages in general practice which is actually more harmful and in fact counterproductive by leaving these patients more prone to develop pneumonias and infections. And looking at the new guidelines for the exacerbation management, we know that how much steroid is required. 
so that way it is required but routine exacerbations are all treated by physicians where you do not need a pulmonologist to look into it but definitely a patient who keeps exacerbating again and again and again and again is the one who needs to be evaluated as to why that is happening and then perhaps a pulmonologist referral comes then comes to the reality now the reality is that you know this is a disease which is so huge you can imagine if we have nearly about uh, i think official figures are somewhere around 40 50 million copds but unofficial figure will be about 100 million right 100 million patients if exacerbate i don't think so pulmonologists will be able to deal with them so we have to teach our physician friends how to deal with that properly and that's what the way forward is that i personally feel copd is a disease which has to be dealt with at primary healthcare it has to be dealt at the level of physicians offices and then of course some of them will percolate down to us so if all pulmonologists sitting here tell me how much is that group a copd in your patients in fact i get one patient in a week i feel wow i've got group a patient coming most of the times what we are looking at is group e and group e and group e in fact our data showed group d to be somewhere around 40 percent 30 percent 40 percent patients which we published in european respiratory review but that was a previous one. Now combining C and D practically will mean that it is taking about 60 to 70% of our practice, basically. We are too busy in giving options and trying to give them a better outcome in this group of patients because I personally feel they are the most sufferers. They are the most sufferers in their community. And uh, they are on the revolving door of the hospital. They keep coming and going, keep coming and going. And the amount of money which they spent on these exacerbations is much more than any other disease can cause them to spend, actually, be it a cancer or be it a cardiac disease. I think I agree with sir in the sense, you know, in practicality, it's not possible. Make care standardized rather than asking for a standing uh, pulmonology consultation, one thing. And the third dimension is the political dimension also of it, I think, sir. <laughs> and uh, as sir said, even I, for the purpose of this particular meeting, I was just taking my OPD data for the last two, three months. Any patient who has visited me, COPD patient who has visited my OPD for more than three times in the last one year, all of them were group E. Otherwise, if someone is group A or group E, he probably won't care to visit a corporate hospital or something like that. And the, your second question was, after exacerbation, should there be a standing order for SIT? I think that also is a bit controversial, I standing suppose. Standing order to see a pulmonologist? No, sir. SIT, because he says... Single inhaler, yeah. okay. So exactly, I, I think, see, the, the new guidelines for COPD, because, see, the Indian Chess Society and uh, NCCP together made the COPD guidelines way back in 2014, which is a very old one. So last year, in 2022, the guidelines are being revised. So obviously, it is going to come in this issue or maybe next issue. That does mention about single inhaler therapy, that it improves adherence, and it improves overall outcomes by improving adherence per se. But then obviously, there is an interaction between three drugs together with a device. So it does mention about that. But that will come in the guideline and it's going to be published in the next couple of months. Any take from Professor Usmani on that, sir? Uh, no, again, it's very pragmatic, isn't it? And we've talked about the value of single inhaler therapy. So, um, so yeah. yeah. So if there are no further queries from the Delhi Hub also, we will be permitted to wind up the session. And thanks a lot, Professor Usmani, for coming over, uh, for educating us and for staying back for the entire session and answering all the queries. Thank you so much, sir, for the from the bottom of our heart. No, thank you very much for the invitation. And it was really nice to thank, be on the stage. Thank with... you, Professor Osmani. It was a wonderful uh, listening to you and learning again once. Thank you so very deep, much. Thank you, Deepak, sir, also. Deepak, thank you very much. And it'll be good to meet in person at one stage, at one point in time. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, sir. And thank you, Rajesh Venkat, sir. And thank you, Dr. Shmani. Deepak, sir, I have been listening to you since 2003 and at a different forum, in fact. And uh, I always feel excited when I listen to Deepak Talwar, sir, or Randeep Guleria, sir. But anyway, it's a wonderful event. And uh, now it's time to give you a thanks. And there is a famous quote that thank you is an expression of extreme gratitude humility and understanding 
which crosses any boundaries and directly reaches heart. My sincere gratitude to each one of you for taking your precious time and being present today on the auspicious event of Mentor Connect. We were blessed and fortunate to have expert insights on the topic by Dr. Professor Ushmani. My special thanks to our national speakers, Dr. Randeep Guleria, Dr. Deepak Talwar, and a special thanks to Dr. Rajesh Venkat, who has taken a lot of pain coming from Cochin and to moderate the whole session. Last but not the least, I am thankful to all my regional speakers because this program was being uh, 17 regions across the country were connected with this particular program. And my special thanks to my core team of Lupin who worked behind the curtains to execute this event, my marketing team, the sales team, and the medical team. So we really thank you for a smooth conduction of this hybrid event. So thank you very much for joining this event and let us break. So thank you very much. Sikhar, now it's you. Thank you, dear doctors. May I request uh, from Lupin Sanjay Kesri, sir, and Rakeshji to please felicitate, sir. The, the, uh, may I request uh, Sanjay, sir, to please felicitate Deepak, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. May I request Sanjay, sir, and Rakeji to please felicitate Rajesh Venkat, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. We'll open for dinner now. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you take the permission and go offline? Yeah. So, shall we go offline? Shaker, sir.